The Black Man's Guide to Understanding the Black Woman by Shahrazad Ali. Preface. The Black Man's Guide to Understanding the Black Woman is a culmination of many years of study, observation, and research. It is a forerunner, the first book of its kind to realistically detail the problems between the black man and black woman in America. It is designed to enlighten the black man and create a revolution of positive change in black relationships. A major category addressed is the black woman's emotional insecurity and related fears and how they contribute to the problem. The black woman's emotional distress is often highlighted during discussions about the problem, but neither side admits the real deal. The men protectively withhold their opinions and the women just outright lie. Their discourse remains detached and superficial with crucial issues delicately avoided by unspoken agreement on both sides. Part of this is because the black woman does not know that she has an adjustment problem. She certainly does not believe that her disrespect for the black man is destructive, nor that her opposition to him has deteriorated the black nation. The other part is that the black man has received no confirmation that what he suspects is actually happening. The black woman's misdirected intentions rob her of the security and the satisfaction she longs for and she continues to lack the solution to repairing her damaged self-esteem by herself. Her confusion about her role and purpose and the interference of Western society have produced her inappropriate behavior. Her main fault is that she wants to have her own way. It is not an unfair generalization to charge the black woman with being out of control due to her rebellion against the authority of the black man. If the black man intends to be successful in mating with the black woman, he must be aware of every aspect of her nature. While this book is not an intentional negative portrayal of the black woman, I will stay singularly focused on her problems and I will tell the truth about her condition. Inside information which has never appeared in print will be revealed with clarity and speed and I explain why the black woman persists in the face of repetitive error to hold steadfast to the principles that cause her to fail in her attempts to unite with the black man. I am breaking a tradition of secrecy and cover-ups. This book will be met with opposition and anger by the majority of black women. They will charge me with betrayal. Some will argue that my examples are inaccurate or that my samples are based solely on stereotypes and extrapolation. Others will claim it a rude, unwarranted attack on honorable black womanhood and label me as a traitor. A few may even swear that this document is autobiographic, which it is not. We can expect the worst, but the time has come. The black man can no longer be allowed to stumble around blindly trying to overcome obstacles and a black woman he knows little, if anything, about. While this guy provides some answers, it is not to be used as a weapon against the black woman or as cause for dereliction of duty by the black man. And it is not a limited work. The black man must take charge of and examine the lives of every black female in his domain his wives, his daughters, his sisters, his aunts, and his mother. Any black woman or black girl he comes into contact with or is responsible for must be studied and corrected if she is found to be out of order according to black civilized standards. These standards will be discussed. This book is for every black man in America and it doesn't matter who he is or what he's got. His woman is his problem. The black man has suffered and continues to suffer in all aspects of his life generated by the problems he has with his woman. He has endured rejection and failure in his personal life almost as calmly as success and triumph. Naturally, during these computerized, fast-paced times, it is not fashionable for the black woman to be in submission to the black man. In retaliation, the black man has withdrew his support in all areas. 
He tries to work his life around the scorn. Still, this report does not absolve or vindicate the black man from his negligence in allowing the black woman to become distasteful. He cannot continue to shirk his portion of the responsibility for her outrageous and embarrassing conduct, and he is the only one qualified and justified to put the black woman back in order. He must not strive for perfection in the black woman. This is the wrong generation for that. Instead, he must strive for effort and improvement and be insistent on progress. When she learns better, she must do better. Some of the remedies in this book will seem harsh and unorthodox, but pain is unavoidable preceding the birth of a new idea that will born a new black woman to live in peace with the black man. The infected brain may take several generations before the defects subside, but the work must begin now, today. The black man will never be able to excel until he gets his woman under control. Currently, he spars with the white man to preserve his freedom while scuffling with the black woman to defend his wounded manhood. He has become adept in both roles. His work to bring the black woman into submission must begin accordingly. It is likened to stepping into the ring with a wild savage boar, a reckless fire-breathing dragon that must be tamed if the black family is to survive. It is the black man's responsibility to win this battle. And lastly, I have taken this unprecedented step because of my love for my people and my dedication to putting the original black man on top. The black man must civilize the black woman before he can have peace with her and before he can stand up and reclaim his nation. From the author, Shahrazad Ali. Chapter one, her childhood. From the very first moment she's born, she becomes attached to her first teacher, her mother. Her eyes study her mother constantly during the initial bonding process. She learns to smile and form other mutual communication techniques. She, as with any other cub, is taught survival skills, how to eat, dress, bathe, use the toilet, general manners and obedience, most implied by a look or spoken in a certain tone of voice. She is able to understand the language long before she can speak it. She never stops studying her mother and she never stops learning from her. If she is raised by two parents, she studies them both. Since she is with the mother or other females, she learns to tune in to them emotionally. She learns to observe the other adults in the same way. She can detect when they are happy, at peace, or sadly restrained or mad. She also pays attention to how her mother treats her father. She learns glances, body language, and moods, the spoken and unspoken messages that her mother displays. As the cub, she mimics and includes these practices, right or wrong, as part of her survival skills from the very start. She overhears conversations that her mother has with her friends or relatives pertaining to the father. If all of the mother's comments are supportive and positive, good. But since the habit of gaming on the black man is a 400-year-old tradition here, the inflections are for the most part negative. She listens and she records. The first mental tapes translate into pictures and forms and they cannot be erased, at least not for many years. What she overhears as a small child may go something like this. I don't care what your father said, I said, I've got to cook and clean up this house before your father gets home because I don't want to hear his mouth. Your father don't run this house, I do. He don't know what he's talking about. He don't know what I know. He don't know what he's doing. John makes me sick. I get tired of picking up behind him. If the father requests something, she may hear the mother say, get it yourself. Or, you don't tell me what to do, I do what I wanna do. 
Every mother is guilty of using these or similar terminology about her husband when she is tired, exasperated, or angry during the girl child's upbringing. The training message from the mother, the teacher, is one, the black man don't know. Two, certain references to the black man are made only behind his back. Three, a woman has the option to choose what she wants to obey. Four, a man is a bother. After hearing various negative inferences behind the father's back, then the girl child observes how the mother may front off when the father is present, pretending that she is obedient and everything is fine. The girl child, while too young to actually distinguish between truth and falsehood, watches how trusting and unaware the father is. Soon, she concludes that the mother is right. He don't know, which must mean that he is dumb. And if he is dumb and doesn't know what's going on behind his back and makes the girl child insecure, he's physically strong, but we live two lives, one in front of daddy and one behind his back. Since the mother is her mentor and they are alike, she agrees. You can't trust him. He is different from us. And the cycle starts. On the other hand, if there is no biological father or stepfather on the premises whom the girl child can relate to and observe daily, the scenario may go something like this. Especially if the single mother is periodically changing men or dating around. She may hear, one, I'm going to get that nigga tonight. Two, I keep calling him every night, but he ain't home. Three, girl, don't believe nothing he says. He just lies all the time. Four, I can't believe nothing he says. Five, I'm going to make him spend some money on me. Six, I got to find me a man. Seven, I want to see what he can do. Eight, you can't let a man know all your business. The training message from the mother in this instance is, one, the black man is a liar. Two, don't believe in him, he'll disappoint you. Three, the black man will desert you, no security. Four, withholding information is a necessary practice when dealing with the black man. Five, and if you're going to deal with a black man, you have to have a plan. While the aforementioned statement examples may seem trite or unimportant, remember that they are of great significance since they are a part of the first introductory impressions on the girl child about the black man who is usually not present to defend himself or prove that the charges are not true. To the girl child, these impressions represent the pure truth from the person who takes care of her, her mother. In the two-parent home, the girl child has an easier time learning how to charm the father and get him to cooperate with her and grant her wishes. She adopts these skills to manipulate a person whom she already believes is not too swift mentally, according to mom. She also sees that the father will give the mother a verbal order, and later she sees the mother do something else, different, or in direct opposition. She also learns the politics of female survival regarding chastisement. If the father tells her to do something or reprimands her, she finds that she can go to the mother and get the ruling changed or omitted completely. Above all, she can usually get sympathy from the mother in words or even more powerful from her mother's eyes which say, do it, you know how he is, or I'll make it up to you later, or I agree with you, he's wrong, but do it anyway. In either case, the father's word is deemed questionable and should be examined and verified to determine if it's wrong. Also, that his word can be opposed or rejected successfully. If the father becomes vocally angry with the mother, she may show her protectiveness by sending the girl child from the room or outside to play. 
If the father is rightfully angry, unbeknownst to the child, the mother may be extra nice to deter his attention from the issue to get his mind off of it. The father may be right, but the teaching message is, one, he's dangerous and wants to argue, but I'll protect you from him. Two, this is something I have to endure, but you don't. Three, he can be swayed with a little kindness and charm. Four, he's our boss, but we don't like it because he's unfair. The girl child watches her mother simulate several emotions, pleasure, admiration, enthusiasm, interest, and cooperation. But the cutting side of the issue is that the mother obviously is projecting faked agreement and it seems to work. In addition to these negative impressions about the capabilities and inconsistencies of the black man who's gone all the time anyway, the girl child is introduced to fairy tales as bedtime and story time reading. Some of the stories are fantasy about the wonderful life white men and white women lead. They tell about how gallant the white man is and how he always saves the day for the white woman. Sometimes the stories are about black people. Most of the children's books are written by black females who present the black man in superficial roles or they are shown as black men practicing a white lifestyle. The descriptions are usually vague since the black woman does not know or admit the good values in the black man. One can only describe with words what one knows or discovers, and the black woman is hard pressed to dig up good renditions about the black man and put it into words. Since she doesn't live it, she can't report about it. If the books are about Africa, the girl child still cannot really identify or mesh the African king idea with her daddy down in the living room sprawled in his favorite chair while she watches her mother work in the kitchen. Her small mind cannot assimilate well enough to distinguish a routine setting from the artificial pictures shown in storybooks. The black mother thinks that fairy tales are harmless entertainment for her daughter and son and have no other intrinsic value to the development of the child. A new brain, not yet equipped with the psychological tools to filter or disseminate information accepts any and all information it is programmed with as the truth. Fairy tale characters, cartoons, and talking animals represent the truth to them, and judging the outcome are very detrimental to the child's development and reality recognition. Consequently, when the girl child arrives at school, she has already been programmed with a bushel of false ideas about what is real and unreal, and what is for play and what actually exists. Between seeing and touching real flesh and blood people and being introduced to Mickey Mouse, a talking rat, Cinderella, Snow White, Superman, Cookie Monster, Big Bird, Donald Duck, Casper, Bugs Bunny, the Smurfs, the Muppets, and Garfield, and a host of other cartoons. She is quite confused. She carries these fantasies into the future, and they govern many of her emotions and ideas. They become deeply rooted in her psyche and will override true information from other sources. She is not just looking at the cartoons, she is also listening to their dialogue and copies their responses. She is taught to love these artificial personalities. During this time, she is also introduced to Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, Cupid, and the Tooth Fairy. All of these toy animals and people are presented to her as good, and none of these first heroes but she is taught to love and admire, are black. Other than possibly her girl baby dolls, she is not introduced to her own culture. Be aware that all of the misinformation imparted in this chapter is transmitted to the black female child, usually from the mother, by the time she is five years old. What a beginning. Chapter two teenage years. 
By the time the black girl child reaches teendom, she is fully schooled in the various manipulative skills available to be used on the black man. The fact that these opinions have been formed from her emotionally wrought mother, television soap operas, Hollywood movies, true romance magazines, and love songs does not matter to her. She believes these are documents of truth that she must adhere to to be accepted into the womanhood club. By this time, she is eager to learn all she can about the opposite sex with a single motivation of getting the black man to literally eat out of her hand. Keeping certain secrets from the teenage boy as a way of life is already established as the norm. It is during this time that the black teenage girl forms a special bond with her mother regarding black men, a type of in-house conspiracy that may include, one, a warning from the mother about not telling the father how much an item of clothing really cost, two, not letting the father know that the mother had an accident or forgot to pay an important bill, three, that the daughter is dating prematurely or came in late. Four, that the daughter is on birth control. Five, keeping quiet about the girl failing a test in school to keep her from being punished or grounded. Any topic discussed that begins with don't tell your father is wrong. This kind of conspiracy between the black mother and the black teenage girl seals their secret relationship one where information is withheld in the name of keeping the peace, a seemingly honorable intention. Lies operate on the domino principle. If one lie is told, the teller is forced to tell another and another and another. At the time, the lie may seem harmless enough. They are considered a necessity. Thus, by using these tactics, the black teenage girl continues to prove to herself that the black man can be manipulated by, one, instructing her mother to tell her boyfriend that she's not home in order to make him jealous. The mother will usually comply and relate the lie to the black male caller. Two, pretending she is not ready when her date arrives to make him wait, sweat, or worry a little. Three, using her feminine attributes of flattery or a swivel of the hips to get his attention. She practices how to use sexual innuendo. Four, by talking to another boy to make him upset or as a threat to test him to see if he's really serious about her. The indirect lessons the black mother is teaching and agreeing with is one, it's okay to lie to the black man if you're doing it to check his level of affection for you. Two, it's permissible to withhold the truth from the black man if the truth will make him displeased with you. Three, there are some issues that the black man just doesn't understand and some that are just not his business. Four, artificial flattery will take you far. All of this reaffirms for the black teenage girl that one, the black man is easily seduced, will believe whatever you tell him, and that she can get back at him by giving him anxiety. Two, all girls play the same games with their boyfriend, so it's obviously just the way things are and will be. Three, the easiest way to get a black man's attention is to cause him some kind of frustration resulting from a carefully executed plan. And four, if she doesn't tell him, he'll never know. The teen years are thus spent trying out various schemes on the black male to test his reactions, sincerity, and level of interest. She is well versed by this time to sift through whatever the black male says out of his mouth and decide what he really means and what her reaction should be. Part of this is explainable. Psychologists agree that no human being views the world through pristine eyes. What we see is edited by a definite set of predetermined rules and values that help create a certain viewpoint on various subjects and situations. The very concept of reasoning that the black teenage girl uses to determine what is right and wrong are derived 
from a tainted set of traditionally learned wickedness passed on from one black female to another, her mother or female guardian. Often, the girl will make up wild stories, create false emergencies, or intentionally stand up the boy or tease him with sexual promises until he vows everlasting love. She may also demand expensive gifts or costly outings to have the black man crawling at her feet, worshiping her eternally as worth any and everything to her. Plus, she confirms that he definitely should pay for the privilege of her company. The means are always justified by the hoped for and predictable end. She gets the black boy in the spot where she wants him to be. She does not know that she is learning to whore. Up to and during teendom, the black mother in rearing the black daughter must explain sex to her and get her ready to meet the world, which she realizes will evolve in some way around the opposite sex, the black man. Her advice, whether accepted or not, is given from her personal point of view and is a result of her own experiences with the black man. The same advice she herself took and used throughout the lifetime of the black girl, she passes on. Her instructions, after she explains the anatomy part, may go something like this. One, get a good education so you can get a good job and take care of yourself so you won't have to count on no man. Make your own money so you can be your own boss. Two, you know you can't trust them, so be careful. Three, all men want is to get into your pants. Four, Play the field for a while. Find out what you want. Five, don't just believe what he tells you. Check him out. Six, don't let him get you pregnant. Seven, you can't tell a man all your business. Eight, don't spend your own money. Make him pay for it. Nine, make him do something for you. Don't spend all your time with him for nothing. Ten, get with the one who's got the most money and the rules go on and on. I call them rules because while girls are often rebellious during this stage, when it comes to setting their own standards regarding whom they will date, they still hear the negative implications of the above instructions and apply them whenever they choose. This kind of teaching means, one, test his feelings any way you can. Two, Sex is the only motivation the black man has. Three, sex is a weapon. Use it to get what you want. Four, you can't trust what he tells you. Five, he owes you something material or financial if you go out with him. Six, be promiscuous. It's a prerequisite to settling down. The black daughter is compelled by nature to follow without reason the example of the black mother throughout her life, which is called instinct. They do as the mother did. By her example and teaching, the character of the black girl is stamped with the characteristics of the black mother. Everyone is largely what the mother makes. The moral precepts that the black teenage girl adopts are not her own. They are split between what she learned from her mother and what white society preaches, and certainly peer pressure is to be taken into consideration. Mostly, the peer pressure is from other black teenage girls who have been raised in a similar opposing position to the black man. This is a standard process which does not vary very much from household to household. The homemaking skills that the teenage girl picks up from her mother may be adequate, cooking, cleaning, laundry, and shopping, or she may be brought up in an ultra-modern setting where it is thought to be cute for a girl not to know how to cook or keep house. If the teenage girl has been pumped up with ideas of being some kind of super career woman, then she will ignore housework altogether, believing that she will never have to attend to such menial duties.
Things like meal planning, sewing, taking care of her man and her children, and making a peaceful home for her husband are not taught. She watches the mother run the house, and depending on the mother's attitude about it, she forms the same opinion. If the mother acts like serving a man as a bore, so will the daughter. If the mother does not serve the man at all, the daughter will do the same. If the daughter never witnesses the mother serving a man because she is in a single-parent household, then she will deem such action as demeaning or reserved for special occasions only. It is unlikely that a girl raised in such a home will have a natural inclination towards taking care of her man and home. She has no model for it. Homemaking skills have to be taught at home by the mother. If the black man would like to have a visual picture of what today's black teenage girls are doing and thinking, he should take a few minutes out of his schedule and look at the Soul Train dance music show which comes on television every week. This show gives vent to all the filth that ends up causing the black man problems with a black woman years later. Of course, this is not the only example. It is the major one that is televised. The style of clothing, the nakedness, the lewd and shameful facial expressions and dance movements demonstrate the low level of behavior of our teenage black girls and black teenage boys. Their dance movements and faces are the result of an idea they have as young women that have to be seen and admired they must reveal their bodies and twist and grind in a wild fashion in public, another Dante's Inferno. Many of the black teenage girls are able to pass for adult women because of how they dress and carry themselves, dedicating their entire existence to functioning in such a way as to attract the sexual advances of a man. Many black mothers approve of this behavior and do nothing to control or stop their daughters from such undignified behavior. Most do not stop them because they do not know how. Chapter 3, Adulthood, Single and Married As a black woman grows and develops intellectually, she eventually lands in a spot that her practices lead her to. There are several levels of black womanhood that she can strive for. Each level of lifestyle choice is predicated solely on her desires. What she knows or earns is the result of how she has been raised and what she is willing to settle for in life. The higher her goals, the more sophisticated she is. Increased knowledge always expands the desires, be they material, sexual, or otherwise. The black woman is not exempt from these rules, albeit she is often a victim of them due to being such a displaced female. The black man must be aware of the various types of black women available to him. His selection must be based upon his own individual needs. It is entirely possible that some of the traits of the black women in their respective categories overlap. It has been proven that a black man is capable of taking a woman and making her beautiful, intelligent, and wise. She is not able to create this same effect by herself. She will have one of the three or two of the three, but she cannot achieve beauty, intelligence, and wisdom alone. The black man is her catalyst. Without his spark of life and light, she does not bloom. Blooming is quite different from having a good paying job or a high class education. Each of the black women discussed during the next few pages can be taught to bloom. Risking the threat of being further charged with overgeneralization and group stereotyping, the following lists describe the three basic types of black women. They are dissimilar only in the depth of their problematic behavior. All are infected with the historic disease of cultural negligence. They believe themselves to be living the right life, the one that is the only lifestyle available to them in this country setting, which most of them believe is the best place on earth. 
Far be it from their considerations to take steps to improve their psychological conditions because they ironically do not know they are out of sync with their natural role in the universe, even though across the board they are not happy. The lives they live make sense to them because they have not been taught of any other kind that will provide them with happiness. Historically, the black woman has had access to lifestyle choices not offered to the black man, and he is not tolerated in showing moodiness, fickleness, or pettiness. The aforementioned emotional personality traits are indigenous to the black female gender. To describe these separate groups of black women, the use of colloquial language may seem derogatory or insulting. It is not meant to be that way. The special language is ethnically specific and recognizable to the learned and unlearned black man. The terminology is not meant to be humorous either. There are no age limitations on the characteristics of these women. The three types are predictably, one, the lower grade, two, the average, three, the high class, one, the low-life black woman. This black woman may have been subjected to abject multi-generational poverty, illiteracy, and shame as a child. She works on the lowest rung of employment due to not being properly educated. She dresses in inexpensive Kmart type styles and her face is greasy from wearing too much cheap makeup. Her hair will also be greasy, perhaps have a few specks of lint and may be plastered down around her face in an unsuccessful attempt to create curls or the baby hair look. She may sport a raggedy ponytail with a child's barrette or rubber band. Bathing is not that important. Her bra strap may be gray from non-washing, and she may wear her panties two or three days straight without changing them or wear none at all. She drinks alcohol to the point of intoxication and curses loud in the public. Real loud. She hangs around weekly in common local corner bars and goes out with strange men who she fights with regularly. She may have a main black man who she fights with at will. She has battle scars on her face, neck, arms, and hands from warring with the men and women in her neighborhood or nightclubs. She goes along easily with immoral dares and relates aggressively to her neighbors. She does not read the newspaper and uses drugs when they are available. If she does not work, she is on the public dole. Welfare. She may dress her child or children in the latest styles and will spend all of her welfare check on clothes and partying. She views each check day as heaven on earth, a short-lived time when she has purchasing power to feed her tepid wishes. She might have a gold tooth or a few missing teeth. Her nails are conceivably chipped or broken. Her posture is that of a toad. She may be overweight and an over-average breather with a protruding pot gut. She comfortably wears run-over shoes. Her heels may be dirty and crusty. She borrows money and food from her neighbors. She uses deodorant occasionally and is overly impressed with fancy dressed black men and big flashy cars with lots of gold. She is materialistic on a small scale and does not like to stay indoors. Even on cold winter nights, she can be seen roaming the streets or going back and forth to an after-hour joint. She is not ashamed of her condition or predicament and appears to be quite satisfied during her sterile, non-productive days. Her time is made up of gossiping with her neighborhood cronies, looking at television, wish shopping in nearby malls, yelling at her children, not keeping up with her children, and walking back and forth to the corner store. She shops above her means, has no plans to change, and attempts to use the black man available to finagle him out of money, drinks, or car rides. She has no idea what to do with a black man herself, and she does not fantasize about a better life. She is looked upon as shameful in civilized society, 
and is considered a savage. She often hates the black women in the higher social classes and considers them conceited. Her world of thought is very, very small. Her ideas are simplified and she speaks the language in flat, abbreviated terms full of mispronunciations and wrong tenses. She does not know any better and does not think she is capable of learning better. She is in a pitiful state of condition and if she has any dreams at all, they are of a black man rescuing her from her status. She is also inclined to respond to the advances of white men looking for a good time. She may sprinkle herself with cheap perfume profusely. If a black woman on this level is involved with drugs or abuses alcohol, she becomes a drag of society and a corrupt mother. Men do not matter to her at all on that level unless they can provide her with money or contraband. This group requires no further discussion. Other than that, this black woman must be claimed, cleaned up, and returned to her proper state of existence as a civilized woman. Two, the average. This black woman is an enigma somewhat. She surfaces as a steady employee, enjoys weddings and birthdays, and may make big preparations for both. She is neat, probably goes to church regularly, fixes her hair nicely and speaks coherently. She is at least a high school graduate and may have some college or special vocational training. She is not overly ambitious, but is an active participant in life and enjoys many things. She is fairly clean and will celebrate and participate in festivities with a zest. She is thoughtful, mannerable, and knows how to meet people. She is proud of her level of sophistication and may party occasionally. Her behavior with the black man is routine and that she experiences a more controlled form of suspicion, doubt, and fear. She may be shy by comparison to the black woman in the first category, but does tend to make her likes and dislikes known. She is not always talkative and can best be found and examined in general office duty jobs. She is a step or two higher than menial labor and could be referred to as corny. She does not routinely abuse drugs, although she may get high every once in a while. Alcohol is her vice of choice. She is capable of consenting to marriage for the perceived security and to impress her friends and family. She remains content to work from nine to five weekly and will see her steady bow on weekends or remain focused on her own priorities. She dances at the nicer bistros. She is easier to get along with than number one. Her most vicious reactions are brought on by jealousy or being jilted. Her fantasies of what a relationship should be like is patterned right off television or from True Confession magazines. She is as traditional in her activities as American apple pie. She does not ask deep questions and is content to go along with the status quo. Her faith is important to her and she mentions the good Lord when discussing certain topics. She is attracted to lower class or upstanding black men who are gainfully employed in the workforce. She may visit the fast lane, but she is most comfortable shopping at learners and cooking collard greens for dinner. She has a few secrets, but most of them are trite. She is not necessarily an innovator. She is more of a follower. She enjoys the jerry curl look and fancy cut outlandish hairstyles. She spends of what she has on clothes. She might have a little car, is anxious to meet men, and exaggerates about her capabilities and accomplishments. She tries to be entertaining and clever when she is with her man. She is malleable. Three, the high class. This one is a smart, possibly raging beauty. Sexy, sexy, sexy. The black women in this category are the most difficult to reach and train. She is confident, intelligent, attractive, at least by good quality standards, and wears the finest clothes, has a high price, well-paying position, and prides herself on being state-of-the-art, aware, reads books, looks at education on television, and has a college degree of some sort. She goes to church sometimes, may do volunteer work, and has a definite political party she aligns with, and may contribute heavily to special social causes if they appeal to her. 
She is a member of a ritzy club and has some nice jewelry, wears expensive popular perfume, and is very opinionated to a fault. Her alma mater is important to her. She is amused by spectator sports, especially football, and may play tennis or bowl. She curses more in private than in public, likes to let her hair down with the girls, and considers herself a prize. She may be an entrepreneur. She may snort a little coke or take a few puffs of reefer, but she rarely gets so out of control that she forgets her community standing and professional responsibilities. She is familiar with intricate banking systems as a retirement plan, possibly stock, and a money market. She has an American Express card and travels. She likes LA, the Bahamas, Europe, and possibly Africa. She may frequent the health spa and buys expensive gifts for her man and friends. She drives a nice car, maybe a BMW or some other snazzy sports car. She may live a bit above her means, but manages to juggle her finances to get what she wants. She is very headstrong and delights in demonstrating to the black man her wealth and vast knowledge in a variety of things. She is the modern girlfriend, believes she is completely self-sufficient, and is not particularly interested in keeping house, cooking dinner every night, or treating the black man with special accord. She is in favor of independence and boasts of doing things for herself and thinks the black man should do likewise. She performs beautifully in front of strangers or company, makes a good impression, and exudes sex at will. She is greatly influenced by her peers or others whom she deems as pace setters. She adopts popular trends and attitudes about dating or marriage, which she gleans from magazines, news programs, or the newspaper. She becomes ferocious when she thinks her man is playing around on her and will fight viciously to the end to prove the black man wrong because she is so concerned about public opinion and what they think she will customarily deal with a black man whom she is not particularly interested in just to have an escort on her arm. She is a rat who behaves like a dog while purring like a cat. She is moody, disagreeable to live with in peace if things don't go her way. She believes her specialized knowledge from her occupation qualifies her to be equal or superior to the black man. She will tolerate a black man as long as he fits her idea of what he should look like, dress like, work like, and act like. The number three black woman is an insecure wad of knots that she hides behind all of her good education, fine wardrobe, shapely body, and savings account. These explanations of the three major types of black women are not all inclusive. Some of their patterns overlap, but these descriptions give a good perception of what is available. There is another category of black women who are available. They are the picturesque black women who dress in African traditional garb. They wear brightly colored head wraps and sandals, bold African jewelry, and have dreadlocks more commonly called dreads. They may also have a ring in their nose, possibly several holes in their ears, and they wear layers and layers of fabric wrapped like a sarong around their bodies, often with no bra or underwear. They may also wear a heavy laden head wrap twisted in several attractive styles. Some of them are clean and beautiful, others are not. From a distance, it is hard to tell. These black women portray a costume that implies they are not with Western ideas of dress and give the impression by their wardrobe that they represent the unknown African culture and the very roots of the black women from the homeland. The impression they wish to convey is that they are in disagreement with European society and they want no part of Americanism and bravely foster the idea of back in the day. On closer examination, the black man will find the brightly colored garments are only an external facade and when examined up close, the outfits may be soiled and the woman will have a foul body odor reeking from under her arms. Her feet may be ashy and callous, and her skin uncared for. Her unique hairstyle, her dreads, smell. 
It is impossible for dreads not to have an offensive odor. Hair breeds bacteria, and black hair that is not washed regularly, parted, scalp oiled, and conditioned becomes matted because it cannot breathe, so it stinks. The actual major benefit for the black woman who wears dreads is that she does not have to take proper care of her hair. No matter what kind of African science she expounds, she is just lazy and has found a way to practice her laziness in the name of being cultural. She may also claim to be living some kind of primitive existence wherein she survives with as few civilized conveniences as possible. This means that the gas, electric, or water may be off in her home. She might bed down each night on the hard floor on a pallet and claims to be a vegetarian or only eat health food or spew some other specialized diet that matches her outfit and hairstyle. Her religious views are complicated and confusing. Her home is filled with African statues, African print fabrics, and the red, black, green symbols and colors associated with the African continent. She may smoke reefer. If the black man questions her about her reasoning behind wearing the dreads, he will find that these sisters who may dress and look alike do not have a unified main doctrine or creed they believe in. Most of them have a different explanation and belief about why they are involved in this particularly unwholesome lifestyle. This group of natural looking sisters practice the same deceit and mockery of the black man behind his back as much as the black woman with permed hair or a jerry curl. Her values may be considered more uncivilized because she is living on a very low level of existence by choice. If she is in rebellion, it is only against herself. She also does not teach her children proper table manners or personal hygiene. They are witness to be badly dressed in need of a haircut or hair combing and have no knowledge as to why their black mother insists that they wear dreads. These black children are shown by example that it is acceptable to live in squalor and go without conventional conveniences that make for a clean home environment. The sisters who propagate this kind of life is most happy when she can find a black man who will go along with her alleged cultural statement and who agrees with her deplorable living conditions in the name of rejecting American lifestyles. These black women should realize that there are no histories of black women who dress and live like she does, who represent the pinnacle of refined and admired black womanhood. The fact that she has no logical explanation as to why she is wearing her hair that way or living that way is another hint that she is confused and has only found a way to be flashy, distinguishable, and impact her presence on onlookers. It is impossible to represent the original queenly black woman by living in filth and not using deodorant. This black woman thinks that by neglecting her personal hygiene, she is making an impression of originality. Be aware that the only statement she is making is that she is nasty and too lazy to take care of herself and her children. So obviously, she will have no interest in trying to help a black man take care of himself. Dirty is dirty. Make no mistake about it. The other black women who sport the dreads look have no idea as to why they are wearing them other than they get a lot of attention and have just adopted this hairstyle because it is popular and relieves them of going to the hairdresser. Her idea is to appear to be black or natural. This black woman is very much in favor of being different to the point of a fault. She doesn't know that sometimes being different means one has to look ridiculous or outlandish. There were many levels of lifestyle in Africa, too, and the tribes whose women wore dreadlocks represent one of the small, lower tribal classes and customs. There are much higher standards of behavior the black woman can emulate if she studies the black women of over 6,000 years ago. Her imagination of what married life is like. Most of the black woman's ideas concerning a happy home is derived from television, 
paperbacks, and the fairy tales read to her when she was a child. She believed strongly in the so-called American dream of a marriage, a house, a husband whistling off to work, exciting, trouble-free days, vacations, a two-car garage sheltering a Mercedes or Jaguar, candlelight dinner, out often, fantastic sex, wardrobe, and popular friends. With her man right by her side, he'll show her special considerations, support her every aim, adjust his personal wishes to match hers, and be non-demanding, heap beautiful gifts on her, flowers, escort her to elegant affairs, and constantly assure her of his undying love, and never look at another woman again, and he'll be home happy with her every night. What a dream. What a crock. This dream is destined to turn into the proverbial nightmare, even if the black man is able to do all of the above except be home with her every night. She will wail as if the world is ending. The black woman is a rock like the earth, and she longs to settle down. The black man is an exploring bird and has to soar. He's out of there. Black women see marriage as a way to finally own her black man. It is not enough that the black man has been forced to be a slave to the white man for over 400 years. Now, the black woman wants him to voluntarily enter into a new type of slavery, one she claims is laced with love called marriage. As long as the black man stays right beside the black woman and is able to account for his every move and provide an acceptable explanation for every moment spent away from her, she is at ease. No black man can pass this kind of a test. The black man is not even interested in passing this kind of a test. He wants to be free. Not free of responsibility and commitment, but freedom of motion. He's got to go. If the black man starts out hanging around unnecessarily with the black woman every night, every weekend, calling every day, all day, reporting his whereabouts, explaining his absences and so forth, he will be in for big problems. The black woman is conditioned to dealing on one level with everything. So if the black man values his freedom of motion, he must not spend every waking moment sniffing behind his woman because after a while, she grows accustomed to this kind of company and will bellow loudly when things change and go back to normal. Marriage is not a club. The leading member does not have to be present every moment for the other members to benefit from his instructions of allegiance. Plus, in order to continue to learn and secure information to benefit his family, the black man must go out into the world and check out every aspect of it as it pertains to his existence. He must do this to stay abreast of changing times, worldly activities, and trends. He is not remembered as staying in the house, the hut, the tent, or the teepee. It is his earth, his universe, and his decision about when he wants to stay in the house at home with the black woman. Any black man who is living under a hassle from the black woman because she does not like him being away from home will not have peace with her. The black man must seek, maintain, and insist upon his freedom of motion. The black woman thinks that every time the black man is absent and unaccounted for, he is with another woman. The black man has more interest in life than just running from one black woman to another. At least he should have more interest than that. The black woman must be taught to use her mind in other ways to discover other needed ideas than to just sit at home imagining all kinds of negative occurrences every time the black man leaves the house. If she would work harder to make his home heaven, he might want to stay there longer. A black woman or wife with a sense of humor is worth her weight in gold. With a sense of humor and the ability to laugh, laugh at mistakes, laugh at embarrassing situations, and laugh at fear when it's discovered to be unfounded is one of the best attributes the black woman can have. 
She will have to be coaxed out of her phoniness and seriousness sometimes so she can laugh and release her tensions about life. The black woman must be taught the value of greeting her man with a smile. She is a sourpuss and takes everything so seriously that she robs herself of the pleasure and entertainment of daily living. She gets uptight if a certain thought passes through her mind and she may suddenly change. The black man will have no idea what caused her to change her mood. Each day, when the black man enters the presence of a black woman, he does so with caution because he is not sure what he will meet. He is not sure if it will be happiness, sadness, anger, violence, or neutrality. She is not consistent. She is, in fact, consistently inconsistent. It requires a lot of attention from the black man for him to keep up with her many moods. It's hard work, and work that most black men do not have time for. The black woman's moodiness is another way she has of controlling the black man. If she can keep him entwined with dealing with her various moods, she can keep his attention. Soon, the black man learns to recognize the black woman's various moods, and when he sees hell blowing in the air, he gets out of her way. When the black woman is angry, she pollutes the atmosphere of the black man. When asked what's wrong, she replies, nothing. It's an outright lie that's designed to intrigue the black man into spending time trying to figure out what's wrong. A lot of life can be used up this way. Life that could be spent grooving. There was a time when the black woman planned to marry so she could stay home, raise children, and set up housekeeping. Today, the reverse applies. Few black women are willing to give up their career goals to marry, settle down, and raise a house full of black children. On the surface, this may appear to be modernized high intelligence and her innocent desire to achieve occupational goals, but we know better. The black woman sees all around her black children with problems and the product of unhappy marriages or unions. She sees children from the best of backgrounds with attentive parents go astray. Disobedient and disruptive children on drugs, in prison or pregnant, and on the street. She sees what she views as a hopeless situation that obviously is not controlled by parental strictness or chastisement. She is not eager to attempt to raise children on her own. It's too much trouble. Another obstacle she's confronted with is that she doesn't know of any different type of program to use to raise her own children that would make them a success. What she knows of just doesn't seem to work. She is not aware of any system with a low failure rate or the ones that she knows of would require her to make drastic changes in her own behavior, so she rejects those. The idea of taking on the child-rearing hassle is repugnant to her. Since fear is the major emotion she has learned, she reacts to child-rearing in the same way. Of course, instead of admitting this to the black man and seeking guidance, she claims she doesn't want children because they would interrupt her lifestyle and interfere with her independence. Plus. She thinks that when she gets pregnant, the black man will not want her anymore because she will be fat, have swollen feet, morning sickness, and lose her shape. The black woman is convinced that the black man only wants her for her fine body or pretty face. During pregnancy, the fear of abandonment is fierce. Additionally, she also realizes that once she is pregnant, it will slow her down from keeping up with the black man, and after she has the baby, she will be out of commission for an indefinite amount of time and will have the responsibility of a squalling brat from now on. All of this represents work she does not want to do and a distraction from playing games with the black man. She fears at that time that her man will lose interest in her and seek out the company of another woman who is free of the ties of small children. Of course, this is not true, but this seems to be how she looks at it. After childbirth, 
she may become a little more ashamed of her body. While the black man is known to prance around nude comfortably, the black woman is more hesitant. To be naked represents vulnerability and helplessness to her, while stark naked represents a freedom to the black man. Of course, some modesty is preferred over brazenness. The black woman has been programmed visually by the media to expect the reflection in her mirror to match those portrayed by sleek, white, and black female models who have the beneficial touch of the photographic airbrush to smooth out all the natural images. Routinely, there is usually one part of the black woman's body that she absolutely hates. It may be her legs, her ankles, her toes, her stomach, her neck, chin, her breast, her nose, hands, eyes, ears, knees, thighs, or buttocks. She never forgets whatever she decides her physical defect is, and her style of dressing will reflect her attempts to cover it up. When naked, she is embarrassed about having small breasts, varicose veins, sagging breasts, stretch marks, thin legs, a fleshy stomach, or flat behind. She sees these natural body differences as a turnoff. The human body, when inhabited by all the different personalities and ideas it represents, always comes with varied and differently shaped components. There is no universal ruling that states any one design is better than another. The black woman secretly wants to be a clone of the white woman and patterns her standards of form and beauty after her. The white man has always photographed his woman in the clothing and in the body shape the way he likes and wants her to be. No one has ever asked the black man to draw or take a picture of what he wants his black woman to be. Nor has the black man ever expressed a collective definitive opinion or description of a particular physical mold of what the black woman must look like for him to consider her beautiful. The black woman does not know that the black man thinks all black women are theoretically beautiful. Certainly, a black woman who is in agreement and submission to her black man is beautiful. Her facial expression is different. She has a glowing look of resignation to peace from being in her place. And her place is a good place, a place of honor and enjoyment of life. She receives respect and protection by her man. It comes with the territory and she is satisfied. And so is he. Black women do not know what satisfaction in life is. They think that peace is not having to worry about money. They do not consider having peace with the black man as something that would bring satisfaction in life or that their relationship is an important section of their lives that needs improvement. It just doesn't occur to her. When she considers what it would take for her to be at ease with the black man, she thinks of all the changes she wants him to make to get in line with her idea. She is not very negotiable about making any changes in self. She cannot see how her own behavior problems contribute to her problems because she thinks that whatever she says or does is absolutely correct. There are certain qualities some black women have that are assigned to the black man that the woman is good material to try to make into a wife and mother. All black women are certainly capable of having the basic nature to become a good woman to the black man, but he must delve into her personality and perform several in-depth interviews if he is considering her for companionship, a live-in, or marital relationship. Certainly, the considerations to be made should not be limited to or based on sex alone. Sexologists report that the total time man spends reaching a climax or ejaculating is approximately two and a half to three hours, a little over 10,000 seconds in his entire lifetime. Obviously, compared to the years, days, and nights, and all of life's contests, the good times and the bad, 
Mere sexual satisfaction cannot be the motivating factor when choosing a black woman for a mate. The propagation of the black nation to ensure its permanence and longevity must have priority over the temporary thrill emitted from the loins. As said, any black woman can be transformed into a good wife and mother, but the job is more difficult in some than others. How much time and force the black man has to expend to create him a woman is dependent upon the level of understanding the black woman has. Nothing is impossible, but some things do take longer than others. The black man must treat the black woman right and make her treat him right. The black woman's problems represent a challenge and a responsibility. The challenge is to subdue her and put her in her rightful place. And the responsibility is to rule the black woman and be in charge of her in a civil and loving way. He must give her what she needs, which is quite different from what she wants. A good black woman does not come ready-made. The following hints are signs that a black woman will possibly make a good wife to the black man. One, she is attentive and a good listener. Two, she enjoys going partying, but has an equally good time at home. Three, she will have a strong spiritual commitment that helps her distinguish between right and wrong. Four, she will be partially modest in her style of dress. Five, she will like babies and children and include them in her life. Six, she enjoys cooking and preparing special meals or treats for the black man. Seven, she will respect her parents, his parents, and older people. Eight, she has good personal hygiene. Nine, she does not wear a ton of makeup. Ten, she is proud of her man and claims him no matter who is present. Eleven, she keeps her house at least halfway clean. Twelve, she is not a flagrant spender and almost always manages her money. Thirteen, she is trustful and freely expresses her sexuality and desires when in private with her man. 14. She shares voluntarily and offers help when she can. 15. She does not hold grudges too long and will apologize when wrong. 16. She will go out of her way to do special things for the black man. 17. She will speak good of him when he is not around. 18. She will defend him against verbal attacks from others. 19. She does not show out or curse loudly in public. 20. She smiles when she meets him. 21. She controls her anger and does not go wild when angry. 22. She will take instructions on some things without being combative. 23. She is respectful of black men in general. The black women who choose to marry to have a home, security, and company, but do not wish to have continued regular intimacy with the black man, have amazingly worked out a lifestyle whereby they live with the black man in the same household but do not have sex with them. They choose perfect opportunities to implement this program, such as one, immediately after she has had some type of operation or a baby, two, after or during some heavy emotional trauma, three, after an accident of some sort or a back problem, four, by claiming that intercourse is too painful. The black woman Counting on the black man's ignorance of certain female medical problems will use these illnesses, real or imagined, to deny the black man's sex. She will often talk to her friends and take their advice and old wives' tales and make up a lot of other flimsy excuses and exaggerate her symptoms to defend 
prove and justify her denial. Some black women who do not enjoy sex after marriage or hate the thought of it after having children will perform all of the other wifely duties except having sexual intercourse. This marital arrangement to live out the marriage without sex is strangely accepted by some black men. The women who practice this forgery ignore or pretend they do not mind their husbands seeking sexual gratification elsewhere. The scene, while weird to others who know of the situation, works if both parties agree. Sometimes they sleep in the same bed or separate beds or separate rooms. They share a home, bills, children, and other family activities, but there is no sex, and they are committed and love each other. This black man, smoldering with neglect and disappointment, seeks physical attention elsewhere. In other, not as drastic couplings, the woman will just pretend she is on her period, complain of a severe headache or weariness, play like they are asleep, wait until the man goes to sleep before getting in bed, wear bulky hair rollers and cold cream on their face, or if forced, they will consent, but just lie there and be a non-participant in the act. All of this is done to discourage the black man from approaching her for sex. As a last resort, they may make him beg for it and still say no. It's a ridiculous situation for the black man to tolerate. Some of the black women brag to each other about the tricks they employ to get out of having sex with their men. It is often a big joke among them about how to mask these maneuvers. Oddly enough, the black women who do this think it is normal and necessary. They are full of contradictions. Since the full indoctrination of the women's rights movement, some black women have commenced to refusing to give up their maiden names to accept their husband's name after marriage. They adopt titles like Martha Jean Williams Smith, MJ Williams Smith. They are referred to as Mrs. Williams Smith. This is not their own idea. It is also another statement to demonstrate to the black husband that by refusing to give up their family name and accept his as the tribal leader, they are exerting their individuality. This is considered modern. It is also a public reminder to the black man that he does not own her. This system is especially popular among the so-called professional or corporate women. They believe they must maintain a separate identity in order to get credit for what they do. During whatever kind of marriage or relationship the black man manages to have with the black woman, there will come times when the black woman feels compelled to assert herself about a particular issue. They refer to this as, I got him told. Black women admire and congratulate each other when they get the black man told. It usually comes in the midst of one of those, I'm sick and tired of your bulls. Many times, the black woman will listen to other women's renditions of getting the black man told and then go home and try it out on their own husband or man. If he goes along with it, she is confirmed in her position and she is convinced that if she presents it right, she can have her way about anything. Black women tend to think that the black man's cooperation or agreement with her ideas is a sign of weakness. Or, if they really are tripping, they think he goes along because he's just crazy in love with her. Every once in a while, a rebellious American black woman will marry a man from one of the African nations or the Middle East. Miraculously, she treats him like a king. She alters her wardrobe, diet, hair, or other to make sure she is in line with his requirements. She has been known to try her Western rap on the African and found that the way she is used to treating the black man is unacceptable to the African and will not be tolerated. The African man does not reign over the American black man. 
He is not better looking, and the African man is not more intelligent. The African just has another idea, so he functions on that. His idea, which is incorporated into all his activities, is that he is the boss and the woman must do as he says. He does not deal with any doubt about it. He is firm and confident and at ease with the idea that he has the authority and superiority over his woman. By dealing out of that mindset, he is able to be successful with the American black woman. Her games and silliness do not work with him. She knows that the African knows better. And she knows that he is right, even if the match fails. It is not true that when opposites attract, they are able to live in peace and harmony. Peace and success comes from two people who are very much alike. People who are attracted based on similar needs and ideas. If the black man's woman disagrees with him on his basic principles concerning lifestyle, priorities, and goals, he will not be happy in his relationship with her. The black man takes a big risk and a time-consuming chance by assuming that he will be able to sway her to his way of thinking as time goes by. At first, the differences may seem amusing or challenging, but as the seriousness of life prevails, he will find that it is no fun being with a woman who disagrees with him. There is no unity in that kind of a match. Things are only right to a certain extent, so there will be some issues throughout the life cycle that will have to be compromised. But the risk can be minimized by interviewing the black woman about her own ideas and finding out why she thinks the way she does. The black man must not be impressed with the initial behavior, presentation of the black woman when he first meets her. During the heated period of getting to know each other, the black woman will pretend that anything the black man says or does is okay. Yet later, when familiarity sets in, she will present the real deal that she lied about and explain fully why she doesn't feel that way at all. With a fervor, love does not conquer all and love does not make everything turn out all right, no matter how hot the passion. No matter how good the black woman looks or what she has, if she is not on her black man's side and supportive of him, then she is not his woman. The black man can tell which woman is his by the way she submits to his ideas and interactions and by the way she works to make him happy. His black woman should take the position that his success is her success, their success, and work as a team. The particular type of marriage practiced in America does not have a good success rate. It is reported that only one in four marriages actually works in the terms of longevity and happiness. These are the same odds at the blackjack table in Las Vegas, one in four. Most people lose. The reason why American marriage between black men and black women fall is threefold. One, hypocrisy. Neither the black man or the black woman are able to live up to the European rules and expectations of marriage. Since neither party is able to successfully obey the rules yet spend their lives pretending to, the union is doomed by hypocrisy. Both pretend to do what they know full well as against their nature. Two, dishonesty. The black man, because of the uncompromising rules of monogamy, is forced to lie to his wife because if he tells her the truth, it will put his home in hell and jeopardize his peace. His dishonesty is rooted in his not wanting to admit publicly that he cannot and will not play the marital agreement by the current rules. Three, disenchantment. 
The black woman mainly suffers from disappointment and dissatisfaction when her unrealistic dreams of marriage are shattered. She has been taught to expect the impossible, and when it does not materialize, she becomes despondent, and her disenchantment colors every aspect of her marriage. It does not turn out the way she imagined or the way she was told it would be, and she does not have a plan B, so she becomes hostile. The black woman does not understand that all of her ideas about marriage were given to her from another people's nation. She responds to situations according to what she has been taught, according to what has been bred into her brain to ensure that she gives up her birthright and to ensure that she cuts all ties with her original roots. Periodically, when the black man chooses the older black woman for his mate, he can relax a little. The older black woman, about 39 to 50, has tried all the tricks and games and accepts her failure rate. She is more apt to be willing to try something different during her twilight love years. As we have heard, she is more at ease sexually, may be easier to talk to, and is more patient and tolerant. She's been there. And while the man in her age bracket may be breaking away from their own tradition and becoming more interested in younger women, she is caught in a whirlpool of floating, sometimes detached, with a lot of life left in her. While she may look adult and settled and has claimed she would never even consider a younger man, she can be approached. The drawbacks are that she will not want to bear children and she will not be as interested in juvenile type activities and she may be shyer. She will also have a multitude of old problems she may wish to discuss or receive advice on. She is faithful and becomes energetic about her new romance. During this span of life, black women commence to lie about their age. On the other side of this group, are the women in the same age bracket who remain inflexible in their ideas about what they will take and what they will not take off a black man. They are firm and brittle in their attitudes and swear they are better off without a man. They masturbate or just dismiss sex completely. This alone makes them bitter and hostile. Many of them take good care of themselves and spend their time with children and grandchildren, their jobs, short trips, clubs, or political affiliates. They might return to school, take up a hobby, or become submerged in church activities. She is considered by those who don't have to live with her as a nice woman, a decent woman. She may also drink alcohol and do volunteer work to fill out her time. She is full of stories of failed romances and bad black men who she claims abused her without reason or cause. She believes herself innocent. The older, more mature black woman may do several things as a last attempt to hold on to her fading youth and beauty. She may wear heavier makeup, have breast or facial augmentations, plastic surgery or silicone to improve her body form. And sadly, sometimes she tries to wear youthful looking styles of clothes. Whatever the younger people are wearing, she may try to wear it too. She will also try to fix her hair in a more younger looking style and reveal more of her body with low cut tops, shorter skirts, midriff blouses, low in the back and front dresses, high, high heels, shorts, many dresses and the like. It is not hard to recognize this type of black woman at the disco or in bars. She is easily noticeable and is generally commented on by the unlookers with comments like, look at that old broad trying to be young, or she's trying to hold on, or she ought to be ashamed of herself. And rightfully so, she should. Of course, other more crass comments are made that do not need to be repeated here. The black woman, when in this stage, is very, very unhappy, has low self-value, and is confused. 
She believes that the only way she can attract a man is by pretending to be young, and she is mentally blind enough to believe that she can get away with it, and that no one can see that she is an old sister trying to be young. The fact that she cannot recapture that part of her life does not matter to her. She thinks that how she dresses or dances will make her accepted by men. She does not know that each stage of her life can be beautiful and content if she thinks right and behaves in such a way as to be viewed as beautiful. The older black women want to be young and the younger black women want to be old, or so it seems. Actually, they would rather be anything than what they are. The elderly black woman is 55-ish up to 100. The senior black woman, if she chooses, can be beautiful. If she has taken care of herself physically, eaten properly, had minimum substance abuse, and had pleasant positive thoughts, she is beautiful. If she has had a man or still has one, she looks even better. If she has been a bona fide hell raiser, is disappointed in her man, her children, and her life, her condition will reflect that accordingly. If she is regretful of her life and has bad memories and grieves over them, she will relate her misery to anyone who gives her an ear. Often, the disappointed old black woman can be found in the community warning the young girls, don't let no man make a fool of you, or all men want to do is use you, or they only want one thing. She may report to the other older women in the neighborhood that she is doing better than ever since she got rid of the man she used to have. She might further tell them, I didn't ever get anything out of it anyway. She is a sad sight. Black female elders, wrought with turmoil and regret, relating lifetime memories about her unfulfilled tenure. She will brag on how she has always been headstrong and determined to do as she pleased. She did, and now she is alone, sorry that her life has passed, and wishing she had another chance to do it all over again. The ones of them who are married and have been happily married for many years and who still enjoy the youthful benefits of sex will be glowing and satisfied. If she has been having a man on a regular basis, her body will be more enticing than that of the black woman who brags about how she got rid of her man years ago. She will dress better, take care of her hygiene better, and be pleased with herself and her life. She has pride and is respected for her intelligent knowledge and advice to the young. The older black woman who is dissatisfied will have a face that looks defeated, weary, and worn. Her flesh will hang looser on her bones, and she has wrinkles from her permanent frown and bad ideas. She may be careless about her clothes, her home, and will talk to herself, a habit she develops out of loneliness or a breakdown of her mental abilities. She complains about the young people in the neighborhood and carries gossip if she gets a chance. Unfortunately, sometimes the older black woman will give negative advice to her granddaughters about how to treat their man. They advise them to live their own life don't get tied down to no one man, keep something for themselves, and go when he goes. They might even explain to other young women about how they were such a good wife for 30 or 40 or 50 years and didn't get anything for it. It is not exactly plain what the older black woman expects for being a good black woman. There is no other reward except the satisfaction of knowing she performed a job well done for a deserving black man and for herself. The older black woman also sometimes thinks the modern black woman has more privileges than her because she has the option of doing worldly things other than getting married and having a family. She admires the idea of independence and wishes she had thought of it. Another group of older black women are equivalent to the dirty old man and she is obsessed with sex, discussing it per se, 
She pries into the affairs of younger people, openly uses raw language when referring to sex, and talks about her own conquests allegedly made when she was young. She memorizes filthy remarks and may curse loudly in public. Her personal hygiene is lacking, and she may drink a little wine on the side or nurse hard liquor daily. Sometimes the older black woman, if she is blessed to still be married and have a man, is still bickering with her black husband about disagreements they had 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. The older black woman can be just as rebellious as the younger ones. They watch and play a lot of petty childish games and complain a lot. The older black woman also remains jealous of her black man deep into old age. She is jealous of younger and older women whom she thinks is laying in wait for her man. She raises big hell if she suspects her man of fooling around on her. She does this in fear that he will have sex with another woman, give her his money, or leave home. She is also more prone to want to accept being elderly or infirmed. She is quicker to accept the idea that she has already lived her life and now she can settle down and stay home most of the time. The black man clings to life to the very end and wants to enjoy the excitement and the activities for as long as possible. Retirement, different from the black woman, does not mean that productive life is finished, but started. His woman will remind him that he is too old to do this or that, and he should sit down somewhere and let the young people take over. She wants him to believe he is old so that she no longer has to worry about him being attracted or attractive to a younger woman. Even in the older stages, the black woman persists in trying to block the black man from pursuing other women. It makes her bitter and vindictive. It makes him tired, divorce. As we all know, the black woman becomes very vindictive and hostile when she is divorcing the black man, generally no matter what the reason for the separation. She has learned a great deal from the blood-sucking tactics of attorneys who have perfected the ways to take everything a man has when they divorce. The black woman, in trying to mimic them, hires shyster lawyers to get the most that she can from her divorce. She is not concerned with the amicable parting, and she is not concerned as to whether or not the black man has enough funds left to live on or to remarry and start another family. She could care less. Her attitude is that if he doesn't want me or did this or that to me, then he doesn't deserve to live. She wants him to suffer the kind of pain of rejection she does. And if the only way to hurt him permanently is in his wallet, then so be it. Certainly, black children must be provided for, and part of the provision is money. Some of her stories of child support and living expenses are often exaggerated to fit the situation. She wants the black man to pay for not being with her. It should be mentioned that if the black man divorces the black woman, the reasons are usually not unfounded. She either did something or wouldn't do something. If he doesn't want her anymore, it's for a reason. A black man keeps a good woman who pleases him no matter who else he meets or who else he adds onto his life. On the other hand, if she divorces him, the reason just might be anything and are much too numerous to list here. Any petty or long-range grievance is used to end what she believes is an unhappy union. While reasons of insanity, extreme jealousy, batterment, drug or alcohol abuse are considered justifiable. There are many other ones, mostly based on her unwillingness to submit to the man as the head. The sympathy always leans towards her. When the black man's family is weaseled away from him, often by persons he has no control over, sometimes it's his mother-in-law, 
ex-friends, her girlfriends, or a stranger, it is a very emotionally sensitive time for him. It is always worse when his woman falls out of love with him because rumor mongers and misadvice by others. In this society, all of the sympathy and support is usually thrown towards the woman, especially if she has children. Others become concerned about where she will live, how she will support herself, what will become of the children, will she have transportation, does she have a babysitter, etc. These are all questions considered by well-wishers or bystanders. Little concern is felt for the black man when he becomes ousted from a love and or marriage relationship. It is falsely assumed that he will be able to instantly adjust and fit in easily elsewhere. This consensus of opinion is formed because most onlookers believe that since the man does not have the responsibility of children, that he can keep on stepping and not miss a beat. This is not true. It is just as harrowing an experience for the black man to have to readjust and reorganize his life as it is for the black woman. He too has to first formulate and situate an entirely new daily lifestyle that excludes his former mate and possibly their children. His tears and frustration must be shown only in private, absolute privacy, when only he is present. It is not definitely known exactly what the effect of displacement is on a black man after he accepts the responsibility of being a husband and father. When this is snatched from him, he shares the same outrage, the same pain, and the same confusion as the black woman. His separation is not different just because he does not have children. He is still faced with the question of what to do with himself and who can he be with while on the rebound. The black woman starts out disbelieving in the black man, so for her, a failed marriage or relationship is expected. Therefore, when it surfaces, she may congratulate herself on the fact that she knew all along that it wouldn't work. The black man who believes in the possibility of having a good woman and a good home is shattered when he must face the inevitable end of a relationship, especially one wherein he has invested time and trust. Additionally, he is often thudded with the collapse of his rights as a full-time father. His pain on being disconnected from his children is heart-wrenching and unbearable, but he has to shake it off and go on. This is what is expected of him, and he has erroneously grown to expect it from himself. Try as he may, there are a few cases where the father is awarded the custody of his children, and usually the court fight is a long and dirty one, Plus, it's expensive. He has to theoretically give up his children and hope that his ex-mate will keep his memory and presence alive and that she will be very careful in choosing another man so as to protect his children. If they are girl children, it is extremely difficult for him to maintain an attachment because girl children historically take the side of the mother. Boy children while more attracted to the father as a guardian, are generally forced by the mother and the extended family members to remain with the mother also. Many a black father has to watch his son crumble emotionally when he is raised solely by the mother. Often the children are caught in a tug of war between the parents who are both vying for the child's allegiance. Breaking up is a terrible ordeal for all parties involved even if the partners both agree that the relationship is over. The black woman must understand that her pain is no different from the black man's and that he hurts just as deeply when the love has faded. Chapter four, the wedding, the beginning. Ah, uh, who can forget the beginning? That wonderful startup time referred to as the courtship and going together. This is the period when the black woman is the most cooperative and malleable. 
It's that wonderful and glorious state when tender loving attraction is at its peak. During this time, the black man and the black woman cannot stay apart. It is too painful to be away from each other for an extended period of time. Every touch is magic, every glance ecstasy, and the delicious exploration of sex is brand new. Spine tingling excitement, overwhelming enjoyment. How could it ever end? The fondling, the anticipation, the perpetuating desire of new love. The black woman stares into the admiring eyes of the black man and reflects his loving gaze with worshiping innocence. Her eyes give the temporary and false promise that she will always remain in submission and feel lucky to have her man's love. She is agreeable, complimentary, affectionate, and giving. Nothing is too good for her man during this period. Life and love are sterling pure. Magnetic attraction is in force and neither side is able to withstand the pull because they created it. More lies are told during this stage than will ever be told again. The black woman spares no expense or energy to convince the black man that she is the mate for him. Naturally, he believes her because he wants to. She makes him feel like a king. She is alluring and soothing. During a lengthy courtship, she is available and willing to try anything the black man suggests. She is thoughtful in sending him cards or little love notes, taking time to do special little favors for him, his favorite meal, his favorite color, his favorite treatment, expressed using her favorite plot. Her flexible and happy behavior turns out to be a gross misrepresentation of how she really is. After the point when she feels confident she has the man, she starts to take a kind of inventory. She memorized and cataloged all of her man's little idiosyncrasies that she plans to change. She believes she will be able to change the black man by subtle prodding and sweet requests. Sometimes, these changes are monumental rearrangements of his personality that he has had all of his life. Nevertheless, she thinks that he can change and she does not doubt that she is the one to change him. The black man knows nothing about this plan and believes that she accepts him as he is, just as he has accepted her. It may take quite a while for the initial passionate attraction to subside and it's a fun-filled time of dating, dinners, travel, calls, and uninhibited sexual play. The black man thinks that her attentions and interests will last indefinitely. The black woman knows that they will not. She weans him slowly, using excuses and justifiable-sounding explanations. When the black woman becomes busy with normal life activities, the first thing she gives up eliminates or sacrifices is loving attention to the black man. She believes that after she gets him, he is expendable and adult and should understand when she has more pressing things to do. If anything has to be squeezed in, it's him. If anything has to be squeezed out, it's also him. Instead of his care being paramount, it becomes something the black woman does on the run. While it is a natural occurrence for work, the house, and the children to take up a certain amount of time, it's not a natural occurrence for the loving attention to the black man to stop. The time may become shorter to express it, but it should not become more infrequent. If the black woman develops giving attention to the black man as part of her daily living, it would preserve the thrill of the relationship and establish a closeness not always based on sexual intimacy. It's not that she necessarily takes him for granted, it's just that she does not place the right value on his presence. In some homes, he walks into the house and is completely ignored. He is often made to feel like an intruder in his own household, someone who is sometimes in the way. 
and the way of other things and people who are more important to the black woman than the black man. In younger women, the courtship may be altered a bit in thematic arrangement. If she has ideas about having some female macho equality, she might start out from the beginning letting the black man know that she has no intentions of catering to his every whim or any of his whims. She doesn't think it's her responsibility, and she thinks that every man should do for himself like she does for herself. She has very prolific sounding explanations about why she feels the way she does. Take it or leave it. He should leave it. She does not feel that her attitude will have impact on the success of the relationship. She is just exercising her options and believes her choices to be minor and harmless. She is interested in having a black man, but not interested enough to put on any special act for him. Certainly, no encores or repeat performances. The Wedding Ceremony For the contemporary black woman, big, expensive, elaborate weddings are in. Their requirements are big ceremony, big church, big reception, big expensive wedding, big floral arrangements, big catered menu, big matching wardrobes for the attendants, big honeymoon, big ego production, and big cash expenditures. But this is the black woman's shining hour. She is the center of attention, the star, and her wedding is the public symbol of her wonderful life waiting ahead. It is a glorious tribute to her big announcement that, I got him! The black man cooperates and participates in all of this hoopla because he is prompted by both families and mostly because he wants to please his woman. She not only wants it, she demands it. Although his nature may tell him that this is too much money to spend on publicly agreeing in front of several hundred witnesses that they are now married. Sometimes $5,000 to $50,000 or more is spent on the wedding affair, and a lot of this money comes out of the black man's pocket. Gone are the days when the woman foots the bill for the entire wedding. The black woman is not concerned with the financial strain, will beg, borrow, and charge to produce this show. Later on, when viewing the videotape of this main event, it may be difficult for the black man to believe that his woman could orchestrate such a synchronized attraction, but now finds it impossible to get dinner on the table every night at a reasonable time. Sometimes the woman may look at the tape over and over again, remembering what she may describe as the most beautiful period of her life. Sometimes the man gets lost in the shuffle of the wedding plans and finds himself standing around trying to figure out his part in this. Usually, Several family fights and disagreements occur on both sides before the grand day takes place. They rumble. After the honeymoon, the couple returns home to start living out the black woman's dream of married life. She immediately takes on the rest of the job of trying to set her life in order. It is also at this time she completely relaxes and lets the black man know, bit by bit, that she expects him to carry his part of the load and make a few changes now that they are really married. Now comes the real deal. Few black women cross the threshold of marriage without a carefully outlined mental plan of how she intends to change her man to suit her wishes. She sees marriage as the contract whereby she can be herself, the wrong self. She believes that the only way to maintain control of her life is to maintain control of her man. This control starts by trying to keep up with him, to know his whereabouts at all times. Often she'll ask questions about where he's been and then sneakingly ask him the same question at another time to see if he'll give the same response. One of the worst mistakes the black man can make when living with a black woman is to start out telling her every step he takes when he's not with her. The first time she tricks him into answering, she will expect an explanation from then on. The reasons she uses to pry into his comings and goings are, one, I worry about you. You could at least call. Two, 
You ask me where I go. Three, because I have a right to know I'm your wife or woman. Four, somebody was looking for you. Five, so I'll know what's going on or what's happening. Six, because I just want to know. Certainly, if the black man desires to inform the black woman of his whereabouts, he can do so. But the problem in trying to comply with her slanted curiosity, which is really interrogation, is that the black man can never be sure of which point in the deposition he will give the wrong answer and put her in a mental hell that may last for days. Her questions represent distrust and insecurity. She spends a lot of time during her day thinking up ways to bust the black man, and she will worry over any unsettled details and could the atmosphere with suspicion and doubt. The two most baneful emotions in her relationship. Although she won't admit it, her position is that if you ain't with me or a crowd of witnesses, then you must be doing something wrong. Or if you ain't with me, then you must be with somebody else. Or, how come you can't tell me where you were? She does not really believe that what she doesn't know can't hurt her. Everything hurts her, and she thinks it's the black man's fault. If the black woman would take a moment to be truthful and admit her fears and the root of her despair, she would have better communications with the black man. And honesty is what she says she wants, but she only wants it from one side. His. She is so angry with the black man that she does not want him to have the glorious experience of having a good woman. A good woman. The kind of woman who is in submission to her man and loves it. The kind of woman who obeys because she wants to obey and not because she is forced into doing so. The current black woman denies any notions of yearning to be under the black man's control. She pushes this idea out of her mind by recalling that he doesn't deserve it anyway. Why? Because he will not do what she wants him to do. She does not know the luxury of relaxing and living her life for her black man and doing everything she can to make him happy. By letting the black man be the head of the family, she could revive him. And by getting behind him and supporting him, he could be free. The black woman cannot know freedom until the black man does. The wise say a man can rise no higher than his woman. Until the black woman makes a conscious choice to start respecting the black man, he will remain in his current condition and decline even more. Some black women say they are satisfied with the status quo of their relationships and wouldn't have it any other way. They are lying. They are just trifling and enjoy quibbling and use these tactics to delay the inevitable for as long as possible. When the black woman accepts her rightful place as queen of the universe and mother of civilization, the black man will regenerate his powers that have been lost to him for over 400 years directly. The black woman should not mimic the ideas and attitudes of Western civilization the white man clearly understands that the preservation of the family order is what allows him to rule the world. This fact is not hidden knowledge. When the standards that preserve civilization are disregarded, the result is a do-your-own-thing, reckless and disorganized existence. The domestic crime rate in America bears witness to the breakdown of the family structure and the demise of the traditional values that preserve peace between women and men. The Ceremony There have arisen endless creative expressions of how to exchange the wedding vows and many are quite interesting. But the standard theme contains the standard American design format. Little does the black woman know that the entire wedding ceremony was taken from the white man's history of being in the cave, which is referred to as prehistoric times. It was out of the caveman period that they devised the marriage rites, and each segment of the ceremony denotes a particular aspect of their life in the cave. It has no black cultural background in it. 
Most have seen the pictures of the white caveman walking with a club over his shoulder, dragging the white woman behind him. This picture is the brunt of many jokes, suggesting that this is how the white man claimed his woman. The following definitions explain how they came to use the seemingly timeless marital rights. The ring is symbolic of the rope or cord or vine used to tie up the woman, the bride, in order to conquer her, and it was used to bind her wrists and ankles while kidnapping her from her tribe. This was done by the groom. The ring bearer is the man who went with the groom to steal the bride. He is the one who carried the extra rope. It took two to three men to pull this heist, the attendants. The best man was the man who went with the groom to steal the bride. The throwing of rice is symbolic of the rocks and stones the family of the bride threw after the groom when the bride's screams awakened her family and they saw she was being taken. The honeymoon is symbolic of the cooling off period that followed the taking of the bride. The groom would take her up into the mountains or some far off place and keep her up there until she came into submission to him. Carrying over the threshold, symbolic of the groom carrying the bride into his cave, her new home. He had to carry her because she would not walk in voluntarily. The maiden of honor, is the woman in the groom's tribe, usually his mother or a friend who helped the new bride adjust to and learn the ways of life in the new cave. The veil came into practice around 1500 as a form of spirituality which was designed to keep evil spirits away from the face of the bride. The bride used to throw her garter from around her thigh, also symbolic of the rope or ring used to bind her when kidnapped. But white men used to create such a brawl at the weddings, scuffling for the garter, that this practice was dropped and the bride took to throwing her bouquet to the women who were more civilized in their participation. Few black women know what they are doing when they plan and host a big church wedding. She doesn't care. She should take the time to use her own history to have a wedding ceremony and make up her own vows. With all of the black women's profundities about what marriage means, it is just an agreement between a man and woman to be together and work in the interest of one. It is a commitment concerning daily living between both families. The idea of separating, moving away, cleaving to each other is not an idea from the history of blacks. Blacks used to marry set up housekeeping or expand their present households into a larger base. Complete separation was not necessary since the tribe continued to work together for success in having food, clothing, and shelter. Family ties were very strong and it was not necessary for the man and the woman to give up either of their families just so they could be together. The extended family ties were kept intact. This also allowed the elder women in the tribe to help guide and assist the wife in adhering to the responsibilities of marriage. Today's black woman does not want nor seek guidance about how to practice wifedom. She wants the separation so she can have the freedom to run her house any way she pleases, right or wrong. She rarely takes instruction about how to do this. She relies on the various electronic and paper media to guide her along the marriage trail. When she reaches bumps in the road, she seeks out the advice of her peers who are also failing at the job of being a good black woman to a black man. When in a dead heat about getting married, the black woman may feel the vibrations of bursting surges of love for her man a love she intends to carry balance on the top of her head encased in a thin sheer sheet of glass, a love that will shatter and collapse at the slightest quiver. When the black woman commences to anticipate marriage, she may make widespread changes, which are a trick. All of a sudden, she may get real wifey. She'll cook homemade meals, clean the house a lot, and perform any other feat designed to impress the black man into recognizing her as a good woman who can perform the necessary duties. 
She knows that this is the kind of behavior he wants from a woman, so she kicks in and does the things she is sure will please him. And it does. Eventually, he will pop the question, except he really doesn't pop the question as much as the black woman makes the suggestion and leans on him until he agrees. This short period in which the black woman makes heaven for the black man proves that she knows how, but she does the right things for the wrong reasons. Her motivation is treachery and therefore short-lived. Her sometimes abrupt halt to the good treatment is a normal evolution to her, and she feels that he should have known what the deal was from the get-go. When the black man realizes he is not only being neglected, but nearly ignored, the good sister may go to Nut City and appear baffled. She doesn't know what he means. Then she explains in great detail why things have changed. She sometimes gives him a choice between what duties he wishes her to perform, since she can't do both. This is wrong. The black man has every right to expect and solicit the black woman to perform her wifely duties to him and the family. The black man and the family, including the house, must have first priority. The black woman who believes themselves to be so modern as to dismiss the home as a place to bathe and change are suffering from a misunderstanding. The misunderstanding is that they must change with the trends instead of creating the trend that serves them best and protects the black nation. Any black woman who is not concerned with the black nation as a whole does not deserve to have a black man. The good wife syndrome. When the black woman starts out trying to do right regarding her man, her home, and her family, she has a very difficult time with the personal anguish she suffers from the ridicule from other black women. They tease and mock her for trying to fulfill her rightful obligations to her family. If she works on a job outside the home, but still attempts to properly care for her family, she will be verbally assaulted and criticized for her efforts. Being a good wife is considered dull and outdated by the modern black woman. Other black women will tell the good wife, one, you're a fool for working all day and cooking all night. He'll eat if he gets hungry. Two, why don't you tell him to cook dinner? He gets home before you do. Three, you're a fool to give him all your money. You work for it and you got a right to spend it on whatever you want. Four, I wouldn't take it. Five, girl, you ain't a slave. Six, why don't you go to this party with us this weekend? Seven, it may be for some people, but it's not for me. I just ain't cut out for it. Eight, God ain't made the man I do all that for. Nine, you ought to just tell him that you ain't going to do it. Ten, girl, I used to do all that, but I got hit. Eleven, you have to train a man to do what you want him to do. 12. It's not fair for him to expect you to do all that. The above 12 remarks are just a sample of what they say in front of her face. Behind her back, they whisper, 1. That is the dumbest bee I've ever seen. 2. Did you hear that? 3. Girl, I bet he's having big fun while she's stuck at home. 4. I wonder what he's telling her. 5. Did you see how he looks? Six, he got her in a real trick bag. Seven, I don't know how they do it. Eight, I ain't working myself to death for nobody. Nine, she don't have no idea what's happening. Ten, I don't know how she can go for that. These are just examples. Some are more cutting than these. It is a travesty for black women to criticize other black women who are married and trying to be a good wife to their man. Being married and doing the right thing is looked upon as ignorant and old-timey. Black women make erroneous charges against a righteous black woman who is trying to do her proper duty to her man, God, and her nation. She should not be mocked, but respected and admired for her good works. Any woman who deprives herself of the absolute thrill of serving and taking care of a black man is depriving herself of a special award. 
the look of peace and satisfaction on the contented face of a black man has no equal. There is no better heaven for the black man than to have his woman in order. A black man who has a supportive woman feels good to go out to work, and his day is productive if he is at peace with his woman. The only way the black man can be at peace with a black woman is when she is doing what he wants her to do. A black man who sees his woman trying to please him will do everything he can to try to please her. He will make a good husband and father if given the chance. A man is proud of a good woman and a good home, and it gives him the incentive and confidence to be successful no matter what the odds are out there. If he knows that when he comes home, he has the tender touch and attention of his woman waiting for him. The black man is the only one who knows what it takes to make the black woman happy because she has no idea what real happiness is. But she's running so much interference that the black man rarely gets a chance to be himself and release the love and trust he has because of the black woman's funky attitude. The black man cannot pattern his life in such a way as to have time or memory to constantly remind the black woman that he loves her. Love is not a sentence. It is a demonstration. If the black woman doubts that her man loves her, the doubt grows. It does not matter after that what the man tries to do or what he says. She will remain unhappy. A black woman who is relaxed at home, cooking, planning a loving welcome for her man, making a dress or icing a cake, is far happier than a black woman sitting at home alone under great duress, waiting on the phone to ring, trying to figure out how to find a man, or chewing her nails off, wondering where he is. There is no comparison if contentment and happiness is the goal. The black woman's natural instincts have become so polluted and distorted that she has rejected the plan that works for the one that fails. She is on the wrong path and insists on stumbling on. It should be black people's greatest collective hope that at some point the total effect of the mind tampering during enslavement is understood. The genetic psychological damage done to blacks in slavery has been forgotten as lightweight action that's over and past. It's much more serious and long-lasting than that. It has caused the people to be morally estranged from their past. The black woman must be reminded of her duties and the black man must stop settling for the jumbled ideas she expresses. She must accept her basic ideas from the black man and improve on them instead of rejecting them in the name of having her own way. It has been proven that she does not know what she wants, nor how to get the things she claims she does want. A big degree, a big job, a big car, and a big bank account does not compete with a big, beautiful black man. No way, no day. The black man has allowed himself to be devalued by black women who rank among the most confused species of humanhood on the planet Earth. The black man knows that she is confused about many topics, and the black woman knows that he knows. But until she is stopped and called to order, she believes herself powerless to control how she is. Her first career must be to raising her family and completing the rearing work necessary to improve the black nation. This work cannot be done by anyone else, no matter what they say they represent. Yes, times are moving fast, it seems, and the black woman's previous steady and sturdy values have evaporated into the storm of American social politics. The black woman has attempted to grow and evolve like the white woman, except their history is not the same. The black woman's growth has been retarded and thwarted because she is trying to live her black life based on the values and standards of white life. She justifies all this based on her anger towards the black man for not defending himself. 
It's entirely possible that hidden someplace in the black woman's psyche is a tremendous fury and loss of confidence in the black man because he was unable to protect her during slavery. Slavery robbed the black man of his natural right to provide and protect his family. Again, she doesn't know what he should have done to stop slavery, but she thinks he should have done something. Of course, there was nothing he could do. He felt as victimized as she, and his brain was equally wounded. The black woman's pain and frustration is so great that the only vent she pursues for release is to fight against the black man, the only man who really loves her. She battles tooth and nail in a fight that she cannot win and one that destroys her spirit and makes her ugly to look at. It is difficult to get her to listen to new information about a new approach to living her life because she is so certain that she is justified in being out of order. She knows that she is difficult to tangle with, but she thinks that this is what the black man deserves for being so out of order himself. Part of her discomfort is that she thinks she has the solutions to the black man's problems if he would only listen to her. By nature, the black man cannot submit to the woman. When she considers the problems of the black man, she continually looks outward. She lists oppression, depression, and obsession as part of his failings. She compiles lists filled with such topics as joblessness, lack of political clout, lack of historical knowledge, poor education, missing father image, and a host of other external mishaps that result in the black man being disenfranchised. It never occurs to her to look internally at herself and see what her role is in the black man's plight. If and when she does examine herself, she comes out clean. She can find no fallacy in her that helps keep the black man down. Confidentiality and trust. Black women reveal all of the black man's personal business to her friends. If the black man has any special information he tells his woman in confidence, you can be sure that her best friend or her family members know too. She takes a special glee in letting her friends know the most intimate details and secrets, even his antics in bed, and anything else of a personal and confidential nature. She does not consider that a confidence has been violated, nor that it is unfair to the black man who entrusted her with the information. No black woman ever tells another black woman that she is wrong to tell her man's business to the public. This process is an agreed and acceptable dialogue among black women. It is also certain that some of the information she tells her girlfriends ends up getting whispered into the ears of her girlfriend's man. The black man is betrayed twice this way. His business is all over town and he doesn't even know it. She tells everything, everything. No subject is too private or too sacred. Many black men think that the black woman is trustworthy with his most innermost secrets, but she is not, and she expresses no guilt about it. Such is the warped agreement between black women and part of their secret society with mutually agreed upon rules and bylaws. This is a woman-only club that thrives daily. The membership consists of single and married women. They all do the same thing. They tell. Whenever the black woman suspects that her black man has shared their business with another man or his family, she becomes appalled. How could he do such a thing? Black men who tell are looked down upon with special disdain. She thinks that a man is just not supposed to do this. She is a hypocrite. She has become so adept at attacking the black man for whatever she decides is a good reason that she functions as if he is her open enemy and she packs an arsenal of ammunition to shoot him down at every turn. She is calculating every word he says and every move he makes, examining him to figure out ways to get him to do what she wants him to do. These constant calculations leave little time for positive discoveries of ways to drop her defenses and let her man lead the way. 
It is not easy for a black man to be motivated if his woman doubts him or if their relationship is so stormy that it takes his head and robs him of the ability to concentrate. For some black men, his woman is the only thing wrong in his life. She has broken his spirit deep in his heart. Some have developed what appears to be a startling attitude about the black woman being out of order. They have started to accept her disagreeable behavior as the norm, and cooperate with her ignorance because he does not think he has any alternative. So many black men have commenced to saying they want a black woman who is one, financially independent, two, her own person, three, can do things on her own and doesn't count on me for everything, four, who makes her own decisions, five, is a professional career woman, six, likes to have a good time without becoming attached. This is not what the black man really wants, but he sees no sense in swimming upstream against the apparent current if he wants to have a woman. It is obvious to him that the black woman wants a separate, independent life while claiming she wants peace and unity with the black man. It is impossible for those two aspirations to occupy the same space or be targeted at the same object at one time. One cannot have separation and unity simultaneously. The real black man does not want a woman who professes any of the six aforementioned ideas. In his heart, he does not want this in his woman, but he too is convinced that this is his only option if he wants to be with her. And he has proven that he wants to be with her. On closer examination of the six postures of the new breed black woman, it is found that, one, financially independent black women make life easier on the black man because her wants and desires are so excessive and times are so difficult for a black man to earn enough money to support a wife and family that he generally agrees that it is a good idea if she has her own money. He doesn't have enough for himself. He would much rather be the breadwinner in charge of the money. But if he has a woman who makes outrageous demands on his wallet, he can't compete. He knows she will never be satisfied with his provisions and therefore gives up his rightful place as chief of finance and budget. Two, quote, her own person, means she demands total control of her own decision-making processes. It is part of her hard-earned independence. Anything he tells her to do or any advice he renders comes under careful scrutiny. Many times a black woman will do the direct opposite of what the black man tells her to do just to prove to him that he can't boss her around. Repetitive rejection leaves him with no alternative but to stand back and let her be her own person, even if her own person is a fool. He watches her floundering about. Three, can do things on her own and doesn't count on me for everything. This includes her happiness. Since the black woman has proven by her behavior and responses that the black man doesn't know what to do to make her happy, he has nearly given up the desire to do so. He is faced with the mental torment of knowing she rejects his ideas, but that her ideas are impossible for him to execute and fulfill. So it is best if she counts on her own self for her own happiness. She calls it freedom of choice. The black man calls it saving himself from endless hassles and debates, predictably ending with her having her way. Four, who makes her own decisions. The black man consents to allowing the black woman to make her own decisions. He has learned that if he persists in trying to convince her to follow his advice, he has to be prepared to argue it out for days. Or he can physically force his woman to submit. Physical force is covered in another chapter. The black woman's loose and ruthless tongue eliminates the black man's alternatives. He cannot out-talk her unless she stops to listen. Therefore, he lets her have her way. 
a strange thing happens next. Every time the black woman wins an argument against the black man, she loses further confidence in his ability to handle her because she sees his acquiescence as weakness. All every black woman really wants is for her black man to tell her what to do, make her do it, and take charge of the situation. The black woman involuntarily wants to be overpowered by the black man, albeit she screams like a banshee while he's doing it. Don't believe her. This is just another contradiction in her ever-changing behavior. She wants to be conquered, and whenever she is conquered, she proudly brags to her friends about the conquest. She wants to lose, but when she pits her will against the will of the black man and he gives in, she believes that if he can't handle her, then surely he cannot handle other outside forces that come against her. She first of all wants to be protected against herself. Five, is a professional career woman. This means she has some type of high class title and job in some big business company. She dresses in a certain way and talks the language of whatever her job represents. The so-called corporate world, if it's not a black company, is the worst place for the black woman to be because she exhibits the internal conflict of trying to live the impression she gives on her job and live in the real world that exists for her at home or outside the workplace. She and making a few dollars more than her often routine job holding counterparts, black men, is geared to compete. Sometimes the competition is so aggressive, she calls it assertive, that the black man experiences the antagonism of being defeated by the black woman in front of the white man. Her independence, strained from her salary and circle of friends, allows the black man the relaxation of not having to worry about her needs. She's on the same track as he, so he relieves himself of the challenge, since by the measures she uses, she is equal. So this is just another situation which permits him to defer dealing with her personal problems due to her insistence on occupational and after-work equality. He knows she will not let him infringe upon her highfalutin work decisions, nor the ones she makes at home. So other than sex, he has no responsibility for her. It's simpler, and she knows it. Six, likes to have a good time without becoming attached. Is prided by some black man because it too lets them deal any kind of way he chooses but avoid the responsibility of dealing with the fallout of the after effects. Black women allegedly have become more careful in their sexual involvements because of the AIDS and herpes scare, but this kind of sexual election only applies if it is a man she is not that fond of. If it is a man she likes and wants to see more of, she still gives up the sex or accepts the one night stand. Sometimes she does this because she too does not want to make a commitment or to have to contend with anything else the black man has other than his body. Her total statement gets reduced to what she transmits in bed. After that, she may have no further use for him. Partying, going out, and sex are the only things a black man and black woman can have if they do not commit to each other and try to build a long-lasting relationship. The black man who knows full well these days that the black woman is filled to the brim with personal problems doesn't always feel like going through all the changes required of him to tame the black woman. So they both agree to just participate in what they consider the good parts of a relationship and dismiss the other parts as just a way to bust a groove. These few surface points are made to demonstrate that the black man is in charge of the black woman any way it's examined because it is he who opens the channels by his permission to allow her to do the things that she does. This is a mistake because a man can rise no higher than his woman. The women in any civilization are indicative of the condition of the men. The black woman is only reflective of the black man's failure to do his job, which is to take charge of his woman. So if the black woman is troubled, so is he. No matter how he sciences it up, 
that he doesn't have anything to do with it or that she won't give him permission to execute his will. She has lost her memory and she does not remember. Chapter 5, Social Integration, Dating and Marrying the White Man. The black woman will date and, as reported daily, will marry a white man. She finds in her relationship with the white man perhaps the answer to all her dreams and fantasies. First, he is removed from the black experience and brings a new set of rules to the involvement. Second, he represents the culmination of every movie and TV show she has ever seen featuring a gallant white beau who knows how to treat a woman and swoops in, always coming to her rescue. Third, he is an alternative set of men whom she believes can be utilized because of the non-availability of black men. Now that there appears to be fewer black men and she can't get along with any of them, she is perusing other races to see what she can see. When the black woman gets with a white man, she may manufacture a complete new set of vowels which she uses to construct her new light and airy proper voice. She irresistibly becomes ever so amused by his jokes and pretends to like the things he does. She becomes an actress of sorts, and she relaxes a bit because the white man does not know the full story of her failure with the black man. Since the white man does not know the ins and outs of black intimacy, he is more tolerant of her, and they both enjoy the novelty. She can wear as much makeup as she desires, and to the white man, She appears to be flattered and falls into her crisp, bright personality. Her smile is sometimes so instant it looks like a flash of sparkling white snow, blushing and appreciative. If she decides to date him, later on she is seen to be overly affectionate in public. There may be hugging, provocative kissing, or fondling in public. She is willing to ignore many of the white man's shortcomings regarding wardrobe, language, hipness, music, car, or job. She convinces herself that he is normal and she must accept him as he is and above all, he is just another man. When she is with him, she thinks she is finally free, free of the black man's hassles and free of her own history. She is proud of him in front of her family and friends or on the extreme, she knows that her social integration relationship will not be accepted, so she keeps it a secret. He is considered special to her and automatically knows how to treat a woman. Certainly better than a black man does, she thinks. She might be willing to fight for him, endure insults and stares just to be with him, and she defends her right to love a white man. She says she is not prejudiced, and falls back on the same explanation that the black man has adopted, that her particular white man had nothing to do with slavery that was before his time. She feels no guilt in being a traitor to the black man by accepting another race over him. She sees guilt as an outdated hangover, which has no business in her modern do-what-I-want-to-do system. Loyalty to the black man appears to her as static sentimentality wrapped in shredded ribbons, and the glitter is all gone, worn out from the endless disagreements. She believes she has tried in every way possible to be with the black man, and each time he fails. And it's all his fault. To just stay with the black man because he is her natural mate is absurd to her. And as her history has proven, counterproductive. Even worse, the black man is irritating to her. He just won't do right. She is unwilling to accept a new approach and allows nothing to cloud her fine perceptions. She refuses to be governed by an obsolete set of standards that imply unselfish conduct and actions made only if they benefit the black nation. That's fine for the public. 
but in her private affairs, she is coldly analytical about what she wants personally, and in that area, is oddly detached from her people. As a last resort, she may explain, it just happened. Nothing just happens. There is an explanation for everything. Even if the explanation is not immediately known, it can be explained, and it is not new. The black woman believes that she has reached the ultimate pinnacle of personal developmental achievement when she arrives at the point of seriously considering dating a white man. She pretends to herself that his color doesn't matter, and to her, it doesn't. For her to pick a white man as her mate only demonstrates further her disdain for the black man and her decision to not take it anymore. The white man can give her new options, new freedom, and new notoriety. She finally gets her opportunity to play like she is the kind of glamorous white girl she has seen on television and in the movies all of her life. And if watched closely, she can be seen acting out the mannerisms of white women. She has absolutely forgiven the white man for enslaving her people, and the white man has forgiven himself for enslaving black people. But the poor black woman has not forgiven herself for being a slave. Her spirit was broken during that time, and the genetic psychological damage she suffered has never been addressed or healed. Her suffering was internalized and transmitted through fear and anxiety, and it was the fear that resulted in her current insecurity in the black man. She does not believe that she can count on the black man to protect she and her babies, she views the black man as weak and powerless in her world and easily manipulated. She despises him for his so-called big ego and does everything she can to tear him down and make him forget that idea. She has never dealt with her attitude about refusing to allow the black man to bask in the pride of having a big ego. She does not want him to think well of himself because she does not think well of herself. She wants him to believe that he is unworthy. She has no idea what it would feel like to agree with a black man about his big ego. She might like it. She does not want to agree with him that he is great. Instead, she chooses to take the white sociologist's alleged research that reveals the bulk of the black men as still shiftless, uneducated, and plain lazy. She thinks he wastes his time trying to do impossible things, and that his goals are misdirected and futile. Believing this, it is not difficult for her to renege on the men in her own nation and try to fit into the race of another. And she is much more tolerant and patient with Caucasians of every age. It is most convenient for her to believe that there is a shortage of black men. Hopefully, there will continue to be a shortage of the type of wimpy, fearful black man she is looking for to control. Since she can't have the kind of black man she can rule, she is now pleading for social empowerment. She wants authorized governmental permission to achieve and be strong, stronger than the black man. She has turned the process of personal growth into a social activity instead of spiritual commitment. The empowerment she seeks is really the right to devour the remaining black men who have refused to submit to her. Dating and marrying the white man is another flimsy excuse used to get out of the inevitable, submitting to the black man. Her new political idea of empowerment gobbles up and eliminates the rules that give the black man superiority and the black nation longevity. In interracial dating, she follows the women's liberation trend in almost biblical divine adherence. She is determined to stay right up on it politically and socially. She wants special rights that will approve of her wrong behavior against the black man. Her violence swaths against the black man's right to live the way he wants to are frequent especially when looking back and comparing her new relationship with a white man to her old, failed relationships with black men. Many black men do not like it when they see a black woman pretending to be so happy and content with a white man. 
but the mountain looks too high and the river too long and wide for him to cross over and correct her. He has had no one to publicly agree with him about the deplorable behavior of the black woman. It seems that black women and white America are in cahoots with each other against the black man. This is not the way it is supposed to be. The few converted black women who know their place and respect the black man as the head are few and quiet. He has needed a louder supporting voice, one filled with the brightness and resounding echo of pure truth, one outcry in the darkness announcing before all the world that he is right and he is good will help him rise. Certainly the white man's free state of mind and open approach to things appears more attractive to her. But the white man has never been a slave. A few cases of indentured servitude did not impact on the psyche of the white male in a destructive way as full slavery impacted upon the black man. So the black man appears outclassed when compared to him. The black man's accomplishments over trillions and trillions of years should not be compared to the measure of success the white man has set in America. There are more non-white or black people on the earth than white people. The white race is not the pace setter and neither is the black woman. They are both the pace followers. The black woman who does not study or value history does not realize that the time she is living in now is not the sum total of the time that she and the black man have inhabited the earth. Her mega generations have existed long before 2,000, 4,000, or 6,000 years ago. 6,000 years ago are but a drop in the bucket when compared to the time that the black man has walked the earth in peace. She has allowed her part to become remote and irrelevant. The black woman sees the black man integrating too. She witnesses him dating and marrying the white woman, so she considers her part of the contribution to the 50,000 black women who date and marry white men as small significance. And others of them complain that the black man is with the white woman because she is easier to get along with or that she gives him better sex or that she respects him more. She doesn't know that he is with her for one reason and one reason only. He is with her because she gives him peace. However it is described, the end result he sees for himself is peace. Of course, there are a few who claim they are with the white woman because they are getting back at the white man or that they want to possess her because they were denied her. These are all flimsy and flaky excuses for not being familiar with the word peace. Certainly not all cases are the same, but each race has behavioral traits that cannot be classified as stereotyping due to the incidents that have occurred in their evolution into who we see today. This is referred to as the nature of something or someone. It is not possible for a black woman to be happy trying to be a woman to the white man. Their natures are completely different. Certain black women who do not like the black woman being with the white man know for an actual fact that this same rule applies to black men who are trying to be a man to the white woman. It is pitifully unfortunate that the black woman believes that she can have a better life with the white man than she can have with a black one. The truth be told, any black woman can have a man. Any black woman can have any man she chooses. Of course, her requirements will have to be adjusted and she will have to qualify to get one. The qualifications are standard, routine, and a necessity. She will have to unquestionably submit herself to be ruled by the black man. She will have to allow him to be the boss. No black man turns down a good woman. It has nothing to do with how she looks, how she dresses, or otherwise. All of it has to do with how the black woman behaves and how much respect and care she gives the black man. A good woman does not have a special physical profile. When a black man finds a good woman whose nature he is attracted to, he will remain with her forever. Maybe not just her alone. 
but he will include her in his life. And what the black woman wants is to be included in the life of the black man. As soon as she realizes that she can have a black man, but not on her terms, she will have one. When she reaches this level of understanding, she will not even consider dating or marrying the white man, and she certainly will not participate in the American conversational habit of publicly criticizing her man. When the black woman attacks the black man publicly, she inadvertently gives the entire world permission to attack him also. Because everyone knows that a man's woman knows him better than anyone else. And if she says he ain't nothing, he's not. Chapter 6, Communications Today's black woman is forever complaining and demanding that the black man communicate with her. By this she means she wants the black man to talk to her and tell her what's on his mind. Despite the fact that whenever he attempts to communicate his ideas to her, she responds in the wrong way. The burden of the black woman's complaints rests on the premise that he does not like or accept the way she talks to him. If she comes at him wrong, all systems shut down and he does not talk to her at all. At least not in the open forum type of discussion that she wants. The black man is very vulnerable when he confides in his woman. To do so, he takes a step into what he already knows is a dangerous arena because the black woman is known to take information he gives her and use it against him at another time. She refers to him as unresponsive and insensitive when he will not answer certain questions about his personal feelings or views. The black woman gets very annoyed when the black man refuses to let her inside his brain. The complexity of his views often do more to anger her and harm the relationship than they do to promote open communicative unity. The black woman wants the black man to talk, but if his talk is different from hers, she has a problem. If the black man is silent and unrevealing about his innermost thoughts, the black woman becomes suspicious and displays a generalized uneasiness. She can't block his idea if she doesn't know it. She doesn't realize it is because of her strident attitude and unpredictable reactions that the black man declines confiding his dreams in her. The black woman has emotionally dispossessed the black man. He has lost the sure-footedness he was created with. Therefore, the often illuminating revelations he arrives at are much too precious for the black woman's cynical ears. The more the black woman fusses and complains, the quieter the black man may become. The black woman is accustomed to speaking to and about the black man in a negative and disparaging tone. She may even speak to strange, unknown men in a more civil tone. The harshness of her tone of voice, the shrill, grating impatience, her cadence and inflections speak loudly of her disrespect. She sometimes appears to glare at the black man as if she is on the brink of physically attacking him. She interrupts his explanations with more badgering, and her disregard for his ideas is so ingrained in her psyche such as to be pathoscopic to her nature. When she is really angry with him, she will stand toe to toe, feet apart, hands on her hips, as if daring him to say another word. She can fuss for hours, bickering, sneering, cursing, and competing to drive her point home with the highest extreme of emotionalism. She absolutely demands to have the last word. She not only uses the sounds of disrespect to her own man, but will use the same intonations when angry with any black man. Her son, her neighbors, her father, her boss or co-workers, her brother or others. She can become so vicious sounding that sometimes it resembles a savage animal barking. 
In her anger, she will throw things, stamp her feet, slam doors, snatch herself around, and sometimes go into neutral. Her non-acceptable ways of displaying her anger are deeply rooted in her suspicions. Whenever she catches the black man in what she deems as a wrongdoing, she uses that opportunity to vent all of her current frustrations. She harbors grudges. The black man may start out arguing with the black woman about one point, and in the middle of the fracas, she throws in a few other topics, and by the end of the argument, he may find himself debating an entirely different issue. She keeps a mental file on issues she is in a disagreement with. She maintains about 90,000 kilobytes of negative information, and when she decides the right time, she springs them on her man. The black woman is not known to practice respectful communication skills with the black man anyway. She simply does not know how to talk to him. Oh yes, she's a great conversationalist when discussing other subjects. But when trying to have a necessary one-on-one -on -one conversation with her man about a disagreement, a choice, an action of a fear... She has a complete breakdown of interpretation of the English language. She can't distinguish between a soft, comforting voice and scorn and contempt. She blows her top loud and wrong. If she would present her ideas calmly and unemotionally, the black man could deal with them. And he does. But since she is so irrational about being right, she does not focus very well on one point and her thoughts are scattered and unfocused because she is trying to argue about everything at once. If the black woman does not learn how to respectfully talk to the black man, there is little chance she will ever really get to know him, nor of them ever coming together in harmony. Some black women talk all the time about everything, about everybody, and usually in a critical and gossipy way. Black men do not like to hear gossip. It is too base for him to deal with. The black man will relate a story to his woman in pure confidence and later find to his dismay that she has told all her friends and it's public knowledge. Or... She will make up a story and tell her man about it and pretend that an incident happened to someone else just to see how he will react to it. She tries out a lot of her own ideas on the black man in this way by claiming someone else said or did it. The black man has the boring job of paying attention to every point the black woman spills. Any and all seemingly unrelated information may come back to haunt him in another variation. If she talks incessantly, it is a sign of nervousness and anxiety. She may be uncomfortable with silence. She debates her points with a fervor and adjusts the language craftily to salvage her own theories. If the black man is so presumptuous as to inform the black woman that she talks too much or that she should shut her mouth and listen sometime, she becomes sullen and depressed. She will look for faults in the black man to criticize and get him back. She might poke out her lips or make her jaws tight. She resists any information that requires her to change her behavior. This resistance is nearly mechanical and kicks in whenever she is under attack. She relies totally on her feelings to make important decisions and arrive at correct conclusions. She will hold fast to the most stupid ideology just for the sake of claiming, that's how I feel about it. If informed that her feelings are strictly emotional and have no bearing on reality, she fortifies her opposition and says, that's your opinion, and I've got a right to mine. Unfortunately, this is not an act. She actually believes that her feelings are the truth. She will refuse to consider any actual facts presented to her, 
or anything else that conflicts with how she feels about something. Her feelings are her beliefs, and no matter how far-fetched from the truth her position is, she holds fast to it. The psychic scars of accepting deception based on her emotions are deep and lasting. She thinks that by agreeing with the black man, it puts her in a position to be subjugated. She is under enormous pressure to maintain her independent, separate but equal identity. She views her difference of opinion as traits that make her unique and interesting. She cannot give in on issues that require her to change her thinking. She continuously waves her banner of fear. She is deathly afraid of being taken over and being forced to concede. Often, when a black woman learns something, completes a course, or even reads an article, she will attempt to sound wise. She enjoys the feeling she gets when she stumbles upon something she can wave in front of the black man and claim she knows more about it. This is particularly true of the economically elite black woman. She believes her textbook knowledge enables her to be over the black man. The black man is not impressed with institutional education in the same way that she is. He would much rather hit the streets and learn things on his own rather than take time out of his freedom to memorize a slew of misinformation which he doesn't believe will help him daily. Some attend college, other attend life school of hard knocks and gain equal knowledge. She will also try to ask him complicated questions so he will admit that he doesn't know the answer. She revels in doing this. She thinks that her big talk will impress the black man with how smart she is and will make him look up to her. No black man is proud of a black woman who uses her education as a dagger stabbing him into admitting her superior intelligence. At the same time, no black man wants a dumb woman who is not striving to better herself. Knowledge and wisdom is not always measured by book learning. The life experience and raising of consciousness is much more important to the black man because he is basically searching for a way to have peace. Daily. So when the black woman talks down to the black man, it is designed to make him feel small, uneducated, and fundamentally stupid. She thinks her knowledge and level of achievements mean that the black man cannot tell her anything about anything. She knows better. Examples of the disrespectful language the black woman uses when speaking to the black man are as follows. One. Shut up, you don't know what you're talking about. Two, why don't you mind your own business? Three, it's such a mama's boy. Four, you ain't nothing and you ain't never gonna be nothing. Five, you don't tell me what to do. Six, you do what you want to do and I'll do what I want to do. Seven, get it yourself. Eight, you think you're right all of the time. Nine, I get tired of you trying to tell me what to do. Ten, why don't you act like a man? Eleven, you're full of sh... Twelve, that doesn't make any sense. Thirteen, don't give it unless you can take it. Fourteen, you didn't have nothing when I met you. Fifteen, your family ain't sh... and you ain't it either. 16. Men are dogs. 17. I do what I want to do. 18. I might and I might not. 19. Why don't you hush? 20. Be quiet. 21. Shut up. 22. You're so stupid. 23. You can't do that. 24. Leave me alone. 25. You mess up every time. 26, I go where I want to go. 27, it's my money and I spend it like I want to. 28, you get on my nerves. 29, it ain't your baby anyway. 30, I told you so. 31, my mother said you wasn't no good. I should have listened to her. 
32. You'll know payback when you see it. 33. If you don't, somebody else will. 34. You can't do nothing. 35. Stop. 36. Get out of my face. 37. I don't want to hear that. 38. Get out. 39. I don't care what you do. 40. I'm tired of you. Of course, these are just a sampling. There are others which are more vicious and more degrading and some too filthy to list in print. It is safe to say that every black man in America has been told at least two of these statements in relationship with his woman or his mother. Most have heard the majority of them. These remarks roll off the lips of the black female starting in elementary school, so they are well ingrained in her conversation by the time she is an adult. Rare is there a black man who does not allow the black woman to speak to him in these derogatory terms. No black man should tolerate being spoken to like this. He must demand respect and deserve it according to his own standards of being a man. He must require respect or reject the black woman from his circle of contact. When the black woman loves her black man enough to obey him and do what he tells her to do, she is looked upon by other more progressive black women as a fool. She is laughed at and pitied for letting her man control her and tell her what to do. If she stays at home and waits for his call, cooks him a special meal, cleans his house, washes his car, shines his shoes, irons his clothes, loans him her car, lends or gives him money, runs errands for him, picks up after him, lets him choose her clothes, washes his hair, feeds him, rubs his back, massages his feet, or does anything else to help him or make him comfortable, she is considered a nutcase and accused of spoiling the black man. She is further charged with making it harder on other black women who do not cater to their men in this way. The righteous woman is asked by the rebellious woman, what's he doing for you while you're doing all this for him? If the black woman just speaks to him in a civil tongue, she is charged with being weak-willed. Black women pride themselves on being assertive or aggressive and speaking what she thinks is her own mind. When the black woman talks badly to the black man, she is not speaking her own mind. She is speaking from the artificial mind she has adopted from Western civilization, America. This is something she learned first in slavery, then from teachers, politicians, the newspapers, and television. The black woman has no history of speaking disrespectfully to the black man before she came to America. Disrespecting the black man is new to the black nation. It developed in slavery and post-slavery. It is odd that the black woman considers downgrading the black man as advancement in her own development of equality. The black man must not allow his woman or any woman to talk to him in a disrespectful tone or way. He does not deserve it and he does not have to take it. If, to defend himself, the black man develops a feminine style of sparring with the black woman and tries to go blow for blow with her in insults, bickering, and name calling, the woman will tell her family and friends that he just bitches all the time. She refers to his participation as bitching because she knows her kind of talk is indicative to the female gender only. She believes it to be a natural part of her nature and wants him to believe that too. He should not. If the black man loses his cool under pressure and responds by flinging a string of colorful metaphors, curse words, at her, she complains that he talks to me like a dog. The fact that she is the one acting like an animal never comes up. Sometimes the black man grows to respond to everything she says in a harsh rebuttal tone. He becomes accustomed to the rough talk and uses it as frequently as she. 
This is wrong. It only convinces the black woman that he can't handle her, so he has joined her. She will drag him under the earth if he allows it. When a black man falls for a black woman and begins to demonstrate that he loves her more than he loves himself, she recognizes this as a ripe stage for her to really let it rip. The more he professes his love, the worse she will treat him. The more he tries to give her, the more she will demand. And the more he tries to bed her down, the more she rejects his overtures. The harder he tries to please her, the more critical she is of his efforts. This is a perfect example that she does not know what to do when put in a position to rule the black man. When she is allowed to rule, she thinks the black man must be weak or crazy or both. She cannot handle it. She abuses him instead of progressively enjoying him more. And the time is not far off when she will be looking for another man. Sometimes the black woman speaks kindly to the black man or does nice things for him for the wrong reason. Sometimes her reason is just to make sure that he does not fall victim to the attentions of another woman. So she acts out the duties of being a good woman. So her man can't use that as a reason to, quote, fool around. So she goes through the motions so she can never be charged with not holding up her end. Or so she thinks. But true caring and affection cannot be faked. If there is no love and good spirit put into the care, it becomes dry and sterile, bland and mechanical. The black woman must be made to understand that the black man must first feel good about himself and that she should help the black man to feel good about himself when he is with her. That means that when the black man is happy with a black woman, it does not necessarily mean he is happy with her physical affection or exciting personality as much as with how she makes him feel about himself. He will reciprocate. When the black man is pleased with himself and feels good about himself, his days are happy and he is radiant. He is eager to go off to work and eager to come home at night. In general, he is more productive. This is called satisfaction. Feeling good mentally, emotionally, and physically creates its own natural high. An elevation to peace and freedom, and confidence, and courage. Anything can be accomplished. All of this is part of the black woman's responsibility to herself. The blessings she will receive from making her black man feel good about himself are unlimited. While she has her own ideas about what the black man should do to make her happy, she would be much wiser if she gave the black man a chance to express his ideas about what will make her happy. A black man can look at his woman and decide what she needs. Black women have been known to treat the black man so badly and to talk to him in such a destructive way that he becomes confused and angry and is literally driven to drink or use drugs. She will prod him with her electrical shock tongue until she pushes him over the edge into some deep, dark cavern of despair. When she tells her friends about his condition, they all agree that he got what he deserves for letting her do it to him. It is their preconceived notion that if a black man resigns himself to obeying the black woman to the point of self-debasement, he deserves whatever hell awaits him. This is a cruel and unusual punishment that he earns as a reward for having the kind of overwhelming adoration of the black woman that she claims she wants. She only wants it until she gets it, and then she reverts to a destroyer. She will lead him into a trap by plotting to do everything she can to make him fall in love with her. She will make him feel better than he has ever felt in his entire life. At least she makes him think he does. 
She will make him totally dependent upon her affections and attentions. She will set him up for the fall. It's a game to her to see if she can make or break him. As the game progresses, she steps up her plan to debase him, and sometimes the change of tide is so powerful in his life that he can't concentrate enough to work, eat, sleep, or behave normally. She literally drives him crazy. He cannot live with her and cannot live without her. The more love, the more pain, and she heaps it by the shovel full. This is a dangerous game the black woman plays because sometimes if the man cannot handle it emotionally, he may decide to kill her. Sometimes he does. When he reaches his breaking point and becomes threatening, she scurries back in place and claims she doesn't know what's wrong with him. She accomplishes these same deeds using jealousy, sex, or rebellion. While he explodes, she implodes, and she hates herself for not being able to control herself. Therefore, the black man should never allow his love for the black woman to surpass his love for himself. This is not being selfish. It is a raw necessity if he intends to survive his relationship with the black woman. He must never let her ego get out of control to the point where she becomes the main focus in the relationship. The black man must always be the main focus of the relationship. This does not mean that the black woman's needs should not be met, nor that she is unimportant, but she is number two and the black man is number one. The black man being number one and the black woman being number two is another absolute law of nature. The black man was created first, he has seniority, and the black woman was created second. He is first, she is second. The black man is the beginning, and all others come from him. Everyone on earth knows this, except the black woman. The only reason the black woman rejects the idea that the black man is first is because she does not think that he deserves to be treated good. If examined, she does not really know the details of why she does not want him on top. All she knows is that she doesn't want him telling her what to do. She already knows that try as she may, she cannot control the black man. Her frustration is that no matter how hard she tries, she cannot force the black man into the orderly pattern mold she outlines for him. The black man, even in his disorganized state, cannot be controlled. He is not controllable. This is different from being out of control. This means he is in control of himself. Others who have tried to control him momentarily meet with the same frustration as the black woman. Failure. The black woman, like America, is afraid of anything she can't control. The black man's chromosomes evidently are programmed to rule and be in control. So he cannot submit to being controlled forever by inferior, unqualified beings. Why scientists around the globe know this. Infrequently, the black woman comes up with a good idea or renders some sensible advice to the black man. Whether or not he accepts it depends on how she brings it to him. If she does it as non-insulting, respectful, the black man is able to hear her and take her comments under consideration. If she delivers the information in the wrong tone of voice, the man rejects it and her. He must be careful in accepting instructions or advice from the black woman because she is easily confused and will decide that he can't make it unless she tells him what to do. Making recommendations is her insidious way of gaining control in a relationship. If the black woman is sincere in her affections and is genuinely trying to help the black man, he will be able to accept what she says and implement it into their lives for wider success. Of course, when the black woman helps the black man develop and reach his desired potential, she experiences fear that he will outgrow her and leave her for another woman. She does not trust his motives when he wants to expand. When he says, I'm doing this for us, she is not sure which 
us he is talking about. She may remind him about what she has helped him do and that he would not have been able to do it if it were not for her. She is ever seeking opportunities to get the black man to bow down and worship her for being her wonderful self. When she accomplishes something free of ulterior motive, her man will recognize this and pile on the accolades. But if her idea is anything but clean, then he shouldn't get too excited. She has heard stories of women who help their men succeed and then he leaves them. So she is afraid this will happen to her. If she behaves right and does not create problems or become combative, she will be well rewarded for her trust. She will be taken care of and loved and her children will be fathered and become heir to the black man's accomplishments. This is how black legacies are made. Another reason the black woman fails in her confrontations with the black man is because she attempts to use the white woman's analysis and social priorities as her mentor regarding how she should get along with the black man. This is wrong. White American issues are completely different from black American issues. The white race understands the necessity for open forum discussion of their relationship problems. Blacks are sensitive about the defects in black life and fly into a tizzy at the mere mention of interpersonal problems indigenous to ex-slaves. This refusal to acknowledge the nitty-gritty problems have resulted in them being ignored and assumed unimportant. Even worse, if left, the black woman and the black man to devise their own solutions Blacks have no published scholastic analogies about how the black man and the black woman should get along. The inside story of life between black man and black woman has been tiptoed around as if it were a time bomb. These problems exist and they are monumental. They hold the key to the black man and the black woman's personal success. A problem is only a question. Any problem can be broken into a mathematical equation to which a formula is applied. If the formula is applied, the answer will be forthcoming. The answer is the solution. Blacks have not approached their problems from a mathematical standpoint and assumed there are too many variables for similarities to exist. But there are similarities. The relationship problems between black men and black women are only different in the degree to which they are demonstrated. And blacks have never honestly and descriptively addressed these problems to the black nation as a whole. The truth about the depth and span of these problems is painful. This truth is also embarrassing and unwelcome for public scrutiny. But the black man has been negligent in his duty to control the black woman, and the black woman has been scandalous in our public and private dealings with the black man and his offspring. The time has passed when this topic can be swept aside and replaced with other life priorities that are impossible to attain anyway until the root of this situation is addressed and remedied. Relationship standards have changed, but change does not always mean better. Sometimes it just means different or worse. Companionship between the black man and the black woman has turned into a living hell, whether they live together or not. The hell has a pattern and affects the dwellers of every black household, and it must stop. The black man must communicate this to the black woman, and she must hear him with ears and her heart. In referring to the black man, the black woman has an affinity to use the terminology, my man, and she prefers to call the black man her boyfriend, my date, my honey, my friend, or my beau. She has a difficult time saying my man because she does not like the sound of power that goes with the word man. The word man makes her uncomfortable because it rings so superior and authoritative in her ears. 
As a consequence, black women in the 30s and 40s and 50s go around referring to the black man as a boyfriend. The black man is not a boy. He does not like being called a boy. It is a distasteful title he prefers not to answer to. The black woman in her stubbornness still calls him her boyfriend. She should refer to her black mate as her man because that's what he is, a man. The language itself is euphoric. When the black woman speaks well of the black man, it is elevating to all who hear her, and it is contagious. Better yet, the black woman should try telling the black man good things about himself to his face, looking him straight in the eyes. She must learn a new talk, dialogue filled with complimentary words. The black man should commend the black woman when he sees her demonstrating an attempt to make a positive change in the way that she talks to him. At first, she will be very uncomfortable and uneasy and will feel out of kilter, but these feelings will subside as she relaxes. Prior to her giving in, she may try to use a reverse psyche and say, why should I do it? You don't. Or, you don't live up to such and such yourself. Or, what are you going to change if I do all that? Or, look at what you do. These kinds of flippant comments can be answered by telling her, I'm a black man and I'm taking responsibility for my family and my nation. Responses like, because I'm the man and I'm in charge, or because I'm the boss here, or because I'm the man and you're going to be like I want you to be or you ain't going to be at all, work just as well. Improvise. The black man should not be ashamed to admit that he does not have all the answers all at once. On examination, the black woman does not have all the answers either. She usually does not have any of the answers. She will be resistant against the man's ideas and not have anything to replace them with. She communicates most of her responses by saying the word, no. When an unstoppable force meets an immovable object, friction ensues and they destruct. This does not apply to the black man. The black nation must implement across the board standards of home life that encompass every black person and every black family. The plan must be the same throughout in order to see unified progress. The result of not having a national formal plan useful to all the people is the confusion and degradation we have today. The black woman's first change can be an oral one. She must learn enough self-control to keep herself from talking to the black man like he ain't nothing. Many times the black woman will refuse to cater to the black man because she claims he wants a mama or he has a mother complex. They make these charges because many black men want consolation. They want to be consoled and there is nothing weak or lacking in them for wanting this. The black woman's job is to be a consoler. Console means to give comfort, solace, and to make feel better, less sad. The job of the mother and the wife when it comes to consolation is the same. It is not different or opposite. It is the same expression that should be shown to the black man and the black child, no matter what age they are. Consoling is a female duty, and one she is good at. Consolation and stroking are a necessary means of communication, just as the desire for acceptance and approval, love and agreement. Giving consolation is not mothering or wifing. It is womaning, providing comfort to the nation instead of ramshackling it. Black women withhold comfort for a variety of reasons and meter it out as they feel it is deserved. The black man who commits what the black woman considers a sin is not able to get consoled. Any failure that makes her feel disappointed is not rewarded with consolation. Of course, 
When a black man fails, his greatest desire is to be consoled instead of hearing, I told you it wouldn't work anyway, or you shouldn't have known that wouldn't work, or why don't you stop and just get a job? The black man is a recovering slave and does not need a woman who is constantly saying that he doesn't amount to much. He is something good. And if the black woman talks to him right, supports him, and consoles him, he will heal and show the world how really great he is. But since he is virtually alone, abandoned, and disregarded, he does not always have the spirit to go to work. He needs a purpose. The black woman is unaware that this is the major continent where the black woman is out of control, where she has rejected her responsibilities and does not recognize the man as the head of the family. Again, the memory of the suffering of slavery takes its toll. Slavery was designed to disconnect the black man and the black woman. Today we see long-term effects of the disconnection on American soil. Some black women are so removed from these types of historical roots that they blame all of their problems on the other victim of this racial conspiracy, the black man. They are more concerned with dressing, jewelry, politics, sororities, church, public opinion, and their job. It seems the black woman who boasts of holding the most prestigious job title is the most difficult to reach. The so-called successful black woman who earns a gargantuan paycheck believes she is the best with all her bases loaded. She doesn't realize that her choices leave her lonely and hostile and disliked by the group she longs to impress the most, black men. Oh, she may say she is having more fun without a man than she had with one. Not true. There is no such existence for the black woman. She is not complete unless she has a man. She is just a coward who does not want to deal with the black man on his terms. And she is at her wit's end to devise a scheme that will make him surrender to her. She has a boss complex and exaggerates her worth. She's cute and necessary, but she is not more valuable than the black man. No one is. The black woman, deep inside her heart, wants to surrender, but she wants to be coerced. She wants to be convinced, according to her own barometer, that her man really, really loves her. Right now, the only barometer she examines is whether or not her man is seeing another woman. When she is unsure of herself and teetering on making a wrong decision about something, she wants the black man to take charge of the situation and take responsibility for her. It is very difficult for the black woman to have constant confidence in her own decisions because she knows she doesn't see the role clearly. She is unequipped to lead in that way. So in her life travels, she tries to look at everything at the same time instead of recognizing the clear path. Things look different according to the point of view they are seen by. Perception is the root of what the eyes see and the ears hear. If the black woman would just change her perception of what submission and surrender means, she could have peace. She cannot have this peace until the black man takes up the banner of change. It is a massive undertaking that only the wise will survive, but only the wise will survive anyway. Those who can see no further than Gucci or Panasonic will not make it. Material gain will not and has not solved the problems between the black man and the black woman. They serve only as a temporary distraction an expensive one. Chapter 7, Family Relationships The family relationships of the black woman must be examined if the black man desires to know what circumstances and personalities produced her. If her parents and siblings were hellraisers fighting and arguing all the time, the black man can be sure it will be a rocky road living with her. 
The black woman can only live what she knows, and there is no magic to a wedding ceremony or marriage certificate that will instantaneously correct her ideas about how life should be lived. Her home life and prior relationships with men during her childhood will have great bearing on how she treats her husband. Human behavior is the result of training, repetitive instructions, and familiarity of environment. The black woman is known to take her family's side against the black man if push comes to shove. If a member of her family does not like her man, she will often ask the man to be nicer to that particular relative so the relative will form a better opinion and accept him. She is more apt to concede that if a family member dislikes him, there must be some legitimate reason than to stick up for her black man and try to get her family to change. She is easily swayed by her family to believe that her man's faults are so visible that everyone he contacts can spot them. She also has the tendency to try to force the black man to live up to the requirements of her family. She will consult them, confide in them, and take their advice. Sometimes she will refrain from making a decision on her own until she checks with her family. Many of them consult their family on every instruction the black man gives. She is known to take her family's advice on everything from keeping house to bedroom protocol. Sometimes, if the black woman is angry with the black man, her family will adopt the same attitude and side with her against him without even knowing his side. The black woman also has a tendency to take sides with her mother against her father. After all, he is still just another man. The black man is generally thought of as wrong no matter what the topic, especially if he is not doing something the black woman wants him to do and does not have an acceptable reason for abstaining. The black woman extends these same privileges to her girlfriends. The relationships with her friends are a vast priority and importance because she can count on them to give her sympathy and understanding about her problems at home. Black women lie for each other when it comes to covering up or supporting a story to the black man, and they feel no guilt about it. It's another club rule. It is a given among black women that some things cannot be presented or discussed in front of a black man. They call this girl talk. The men prefer to call it what it is, gossip. They will stay on the phone for hours discussing and debating other people's problems. They will yak around the clock. But there is another level of conversation that the black man does not hear and does not know exists. Most of this is classified as some more girl talk, but it is of a more vile nature and filthy language and references are exclusively reserved for the discussion of black men. This conversation is protected from the ears of the black man because black women know the subject matter would shock and appall him. It is during this conversation that black women laugh at and make fun of the black man and brag about the successes of their tricks played on him. They laugh at how he talks, walks, dresses, what he does for a living, and how he performs in bed. All black men get grouped together during these sessions, and they have no special loyalty to any man, whether he is their husband or not. The black woman has perfected the art of deception, and she can fool the black man into thinking she admires something, and then later on with the girl she may go back and tell them what a fool he is. Whenever the black man manages to win an argument, get his way, or make the black woman submit to something, she calls in the troops to discuss the problem and get advice on how to handle it. The worst result is that she will have to admit the black man is right, so she searches and researches among other women until she finds a solution. She stops at nothing to prove him wrong. It may be days later, but she will not drop the issue until she gets him to admit he made a mistake or doesn't know something. They will also devise very intricate and deceptive tests among their friends or relatives. They believe themselves to be the ultimate test givers, and the black man's actions under the rules of the test determine the grade he receives. She will set the black man up, 
to see if he will respond to the sexual advances of another woman. She may use a family member or a friend he doesn't know. Whatever the appointed actress reports is what the black woman will believe. She naturally believes a woman who claims that her man tried to seduce her or made a pass at her. This confirms the suspicion she has had all the while and all hell breaks loose. The black man is so trusting that he is surprised that they actually set him up. He must remember that he cannot trust her. Left to her own warped devices, she will create confusion and put the black man in hell about it by blaming him. She cannot be trusted, nor can her motives be trusted, until she is trained, and she is hard to train to behave properly. Sometimes, the entire family structure is tainted with wrong ideas and wrong treatment of the black man. Her family will show misplaced loyalty to her by using the principles that blood is thicker than mud, men will be men, and a nigger ain't. These principles are not always at work in his family, but the black woman is perfectly comfortable saying negative things about the black man to his mother, who also belongs to the Black Women's Secret Allegiance Club. Sometimes the mother will agree with the daughter-in-law, be sympathetic, and tell her how to handle him. All black women are familiar with the experience of trying to get a black man to do something, and he refuses to do it. Therefore, all of them understand the predicament of trying to live with a defiant black man, the one who is a hindrance to the happiness of the black woman. While black women believe that they would change if the black man would, they use the excuse that since he won't change, they won't either. This attitude drains the lifeblood out of the black nation. The black man has a proven history of being in charge of his woman and his nation, and he does not have to be ashamed of his nature just because the black woman claims she can't follow him. She is the loser in this. The mystery, intrigue, and suspense the black woman perpetrates must stop. She uses behavioral modification techniques on the black man to force him to go along with her ideas about how he and she should be. Her ideas are clouded by Western society ideas, but she thinks that her opinions and ideas come from herself. They do not. As a result of not having any ties to her cultural roots, she is open to any and all suggestions from any other race. She thinks that how she is is natural and that her ideas are from a sequence of mathematical events which have evolved to produce who and what she is today. No nation can rise when the natural order of the behavior of the male and the female have been altered against their wishes by force. No species can survive if the female of the genus disturbs the balance of her nature by acting other than herself. The black woman does not accept the real definition of who she is. She thinks that she has several choices of how she can be. She chooses randomly, and if her choice proves to be unsuccessful, she chooses another. She may adopt several kinds of lifestyles and purposes during her adult tenure. She changes religions and opinions as easily as she changes her shoes. She does not realize that her floundering purposes destroy her nation and create unstable offspring. No family can be successful if all the members have different beliefs and value systems. There must be agreement on the unity of purpose and goals. The purpose must describe the principles by which the family will reach the goals. What blacks have in their family relationships now makes for disconnection and scattered family ties where there are no overall laws which are respected by all the members. Thus, the black woman being the first teacher of the family members, since they are all born of a woman, must instill in the family children unified training and rules. There are some black women, as a result of emotionally traumatic childhoods, who do not get along well with their parents, especially their mother. They have been known to talk to her very disrespectfully and treat her badly. They are inconsiderate to her wishes and desires, 
and have become so used to talking to her roughly that they do so in front of other people who may be shocked and outraged that a daughter would treat her own mother in such an awful way. Many of these women are frustrated and blame their mothers for being the reason they are so confused and or unsuccessful in their adult relationships. Others treat them badly because they think they are in the way and try to butt into their business too much. No matter what the reason, no black woman should treat her mother, the one who brought her in the world, with disrespect. Albeit there may be just cause for the adult daughter to feel regret or hostilities, it is not right to verbally or physically abuse old people. Many older blacks are financially unable to support themselves, are too ill to live alone, or just desire to be with their grown-up children. When it is possible, the older parents should be allowed to have quarters in the same house, nearby, or even in the attic or basement of the home of their children if they have no place else to go. Extended family members should not be rejected as useless because they are growing older, have ailments, or do not want to live alone. Neither should the black woman hassle the black man because he treats his mother better than she treats hers. Lifelong disagreements should be discussed and settled with the black man being the arbitrator if necessary. The black woman can have no real peace in her own life as she is carrying unresolved hostilities or grudges against her own mother. This also goes for her relationship with her father. Often black women who grew up without a father head in the house or who grew up overhearing her mother defame her father's name or who saw activities she deciphered as bad treatment against her mother by her father, do not know how to live with a black man in peace. She brings a hidden agenda to the relationship of distrust and sometimes hate for all men, which may be deeply rooted in her childhood experiences with her own father or other menfolk in her household. A black woman who was raised in a broken home environment has no masculine mentor by which to pattern her behavior towards her own man. In this kind of situation, the only example she has of how to treat a man comes from television, movies, books, and magazines, plus her friend's experiences. She will have a tumultuous time adjusting to living with a man daily and treating him properly. She will be defensive, secretive, and suspicious, she will also be combative when challenged on her actions towards her man. She will also have a difficult time raising her sons and daughters because she will not know how to teach them their proper and natural roles in life. Try as she may, unless she is given new instructions and information from another source, she will revert eventually to her own mother's behavior traits, even if she currently deplores the way her mother raised her. It is all she knows. By the time she studies, listens, and learns how to behave to make her relationship successful or raise her children properly, it is often too late. The relationship with the man may be irretrievably damaged and the children may be grown. In addition to the wasted lifetime spent fighting against her man, she will be sending her own children off into the world, ill-prepared to get along with their mates. Thus, the perpetuation of an inherited culture of family maladjustment is passed from one generation to the next, and problems of not knowing how to mate successfully are then compounded by racism. All of these habits result in the black community being disorganized because none of the inhabitants know what they should be doing or why. The family structure remains the primary institution of learning. The black people in America have commenced to recognizing and acknowledging the fact that blacks do not know their history, where they came from, and therefore have no collective sense of direction about where they should be going. However, since no acceptable explanation or definition has been adopted as the official doctrine, Blacks remain emotionally disabled and psychologically disjointed. Over the years, 
The terminology has changed. The styles of expression have changed. And each generation of blacks continue to point outward, blaming socioeconomic pressures as the culprit. The last 300 years have theoretically been spent identifying the problems. Little has been done to eradicate them. The American government has been powerless to intervene on a social level to straighten out the black family. It is not their responsibility anyway. It is the black man's responsibility to straighten out his own family, starting with the black woman. When he corrects her, he corrects his entire nation. He cannot do it alone because he does not raise the children by himself. He can set the example in his own home by treating his woman and children right, being obedient and respectful to his own mother and father, and becoming steadfast in his determination to make a change. He and the men closest to him must meet and honestly take a look at the status of the black family and their interpersonal relationships, and perhaps make agreements to make changes in their homes. Backpedaling around the issues and continuing to be scared of the black woman has no place in getting this job done. The black woman is in shambles because she does not understand the principles of familyhood. Family Secrets If the black man asks the black woman too many questions about her family background or about what's going on in his own home or in her day-to-day life, he is charged with being nosy or trying to get in her business. Black women keep secrets and assume that certain family activities and information are none of his business and do not affect him. If pestered, they try to convince the black man that his inquiries are connected to his nagging and prying ways. The black man has every right to know what's going on in his own family and in his own home. If he does not know the internal workings of his own household, he is at a disadvantage since he has a plethora of responsibilities to his family, from protection to support. He cannot do his part when important minor or major information is kept from him. Sometimes the only way the black man knows what's going on in his home is to ask the children, or wait until somebody on the outside tells him. He is sometimes treated as an intruder in his own house. Black women enlist their families, children, and girlfriends to keep information away from the black man. Interestingly enough, they all cooperate in her scheme to keep the black man from knowing the real truth about his environment. The end result of a black man living and sleeping in quarters where he is not privy to what's going on is chaos. Usually, the man is aware of certain ideas or activities floating in the atmosphere of his home or her home, but he does not know the origin. All of the involved parties profess denial and remain closed-mouthed out of loyalty to the woman. The more he presses to find out what's really going on, the more determined she becomes to keep secrets from him. Some are better at this than others. Lying is a practice literally all black women participate in. Some of the lying goes on for years. It is a foregone conclusion that certain information and topics are purposely adjusted for the ears of the black man. The black woman claims that she keeps secrets from the black man because he doesn't understand or can't handle it or that he won't like what's going on and give her a problem about it. She knows that certain kinds of foolishness and nonsense will be unworthy of his support and he will fight against it. Therefore, she thinks the only way she can operate and do her thing is to keep him from knowing about it. The black woman's methods of depriving the black man of necessary or crucial information are multifarious and subtle. If she is lying about something, all of her transactions are predicated on the black man not finding out the truth. Her ability to cover up lies and disguise the truth is impersonal and matter of fact. She feels no guilt. Lies are a bleak necessity in her life to continue her tragic defiance against the black man. 
In rare moments, she may look over at him and see him struggling to live with her lies and sneakiness and may experience a glimpse of compassion. She knows she has lied for so long about things that it is impossible to go back and tell the truth or erase them. For as far back as she can remember, she has been tricking him and playing some kind of game on his mind. Sometimes she lies just to keep him busy, trying to figure out the truth. It is like a game to her. The winner gets to have his or her way. Sometimes she lies because she believes that a few little white lies spice up the relationship and make it more interesting. She defends lying by claiming they add to the excitement and intrigue of keeping him guessing. She never considers the kind of unhappy, miserable personality it takes to need lies as a stimulus to make a relationship successful. This is some more nonsense she learned from television and magazine stories. In adhering to the theory that lies are permissible, she must also reject the authenticity of right and wrong. Her modern state-of-the-art values tell her that nothing is all right or all wrong. She deals with situation ethics. She lies or tells the truth depending on the situation. She obeys or is disobedient according to the situation and is agreeable or disagreeable according to the situation. She has no overriding principles governing her life whereby she is able to observe and make a determination about validity and use that decision as a constant. Her judgments are spontaneous and change. She is ruleless. If she catches herself being too nice to the black man, she calls herself back to order because she does not want him to take her for granted or to decide that anything he does is okay with her. She has been told somewhere that black men like it when you treat them badly, and the fact that he keeps coming back for more makes her conclude that this must be true. She doesn't consider that the black man keeps coming back because he loves her and hasn't given up on her. She never really believes that he loves her because she thinks that whether or not he loves her is dependent upon whether or not he is attracted to another woman. And if he does become attracted to another woman, that is the proof that he doesn't really love her. She doesn't feel safe and she doesn't feel qualified to be completely loved for being her natural self. So she keeps up a front around the black man because she thinks that her front is better than the real her. She is a strange human animal and a prime example based on her thinking patterns of the remnants of the limited mental and emotional development allowed during slavery and the need for complete secrecy of one's ideas. She represents the genetic mutation created from that period. She naturally rejects any explanation offered to her about the cause of her ambivalence. Yes, the job looks insurmountable. Her problems are rigid and she is possessed by an evil that is not her own. She is held mentally captive inside the barriers of Western civilization's ideas and practices. The mentally imprisoned black woman must be freed and called upon to rise and accept the reprieve offered to her by the black man to reunite her with her nation. The black man must be firm in this. He cannot practice weakness or be wimpy. He must take charge with as much force as required because it makes no sense to practice nonviolence during war. And there is a war of the worst kind going on between the black man and the black woman over who is going to be the boss and who is going to lead the way. There is a severe penalty awaiting the black woman if she persists in fighting her battle through the children and in the bedroom. The black man must take on this challenge. The black woman's voiceless brain is crying out louder and louder for him to conquer her and to fight and destroy the ferocious demons inhabiting her head. These demons are in the form of bad ideas and bad morals. He must remember that she is not as tough as she acts. She is mostly a lot of mouth. She can be a number of things as already proven but she cannot be a man. 
If the black man commences a national project to put the black woman back in order and under his control, he will not be interfered with because the whole world knows that the black woman has been out of control for an inordinate length of time. The black man is the only one on earth who can restore her to herself, a beautiful, righteous woman, wife, and mother. Chapter 8, Money As a rule, the black woman cannot be fully trusted in money matters between she and the black man. Somehow, she equates the amount of money a black man makes or spends on her with how much he loves her. If he takes her out, she expects, from her fairy tale roots, for him to lay out the red carpet. She expects to be entertained in the most opulent fashion, ride in the most exclusive vehicle, and be dressed to the hilt. If the man falters on any of the above, he is considered to be cheap and classless, and she will make a bad report about him to her friends. Her meal may consist of the most extravagant entree on the menu, and she may not eat a bite of it, but she wants the black man to prove that he will buy it for her anyway. She wants to be wined and dined, wooed and cooed, kissed and missed every weekend. She has so convinced the black man that money is what impresses her most that sometimes he too begins to believe that with money he can get her to do anything. So near the end of one of her expensive evenings out, she may drop a little hint to her date that she has no intention of bedding down with him for the night just because he took her out to dinner and spent a huge amount of money on her. If he protests, she becomes indignant and claims that she doesn't understand why he feels like that. If the black woman is married, it is an old adage among black women to advise each other to put something on the side or away for yourself because you never know what's going to happen. This is an old program recommending that the black woman steal a little money a little at a time and put it up for a rainy day. The rainy day is considered to be the day when the black man runs out on her and leaves her broke and alone. Going into a marital or live-in relationship that requires financial disclosure is therefore not a welcome commitment to the black woman because she believes she must maintain some financial security of her own. She hides a little money away, but of course, it requires her to lie, steal, and cheat. She may have to skim off the grocery money, the charge accounts, or the utility bills, but she sneaks a few dollars here and there until she has a nice little nest egg. Generally, not enough to do anything big, but enough to perhaps do something special for herself. She repeats this process several times during the relationship and then launches into another lying process to explain where she got the newly purchased item from or to hide it away completely, wearing it or using it only when the man is not present. If she is working, she does not like the black man to know exactly how much she actually nets. She can't let him count my money. So she slides around the topic whenever it comes up or hides her pay stubs. She considers money as a private matter, not to be overly discussed or shared. As long as she pays her part of the bills or whatever the arrangement, she believes he should mind his own business. Disclosure would prevent her from manipulating the budget. If she does put her money into the home community pot, she often maintains her ownership by referring to her contribution as my money. Any money she earns, she considers her money instead of our money. When the black man finds that a black woman has these kinds of ideas about money, ideas like the man has to spend some money on her if he wants her to be pleasant and have a good time, or that money is the measure used to determine if she will see him again and for how long, he recognizes the root of her idea, which is grounded in being a whore. He may change his format and expect the bounty, which in most cases is sex, which makes him the trick. Plus, no matter how it turns out, she will call her friends and brag the next day about how she made him take her out and spend some money on her and that she didn't do 
or give him anything back in return. She made the rules, and when it's time for her to pay the cost, she reneges. She also expects the finest of gifts for her birthday or holidays. She judges the black man's sincerity by how much he spent on her gift or whether or not he had to sacrifice to buy it. If the gift is unacceptable, she calls her friends and tells them about how jive it was. Usually in front of the black man's face, she will feign surprise and happiness and pretend to be thrilled with the gift. She will also buy him expensive gifts as a way to set the scale on what he should buy her when her turn comes around. If she is trying to impress him or get him to care more about her, she may purchase expensive gifts for him without his knowledge or request. She may buy him things to gain some leverage in the relationship. To her, gift giving is connected to ownership. She thinks that if she does a lot of nice things for him or spends a lot of money on him, that he will remember her kindness and not do her wrong. This is her own script and the black man knows nothing about it, and it is not used as a reason for him to behave one way or another. She rarely gets what she thinks she's paying for, including no refund. If the black man should have occasion to ask the black woman, even his wife, for money, she will agree to make him a loan, and woe to the black man who does not pay the black woman back her money. She will nag and nag, keep score and count of what he owes her until he pays her back. She may keep a tally for a year, compounding interest, reminding him almost daily about his debt to her. She believes that the bottom line of everything is the money. She will buy personal items, usually clothes for herself and hide them in the back of the closet at her mother's house or girlfriend's house until she sees an opportunity to sneak them in. A few weeks later, she will ease them into her wardrobe, and if her man asks about them, she will make up some story about a sale or that her girlfriend gave it to her or her family bought it for her. She will hide the charge account bills or receipts so that her man will never know where the stuff came from. She is selfish when it comes to cash. The black woman will spend umpteen dollars on clothes if she is allowed. And beware of the nearly poor black woman who spends a lot of money on clothes or gifts for her man because she may be neglecting her children to do so in hopes of impressing the man with her love or richness. She will also beg for or employ the black man to give her money on clothes or other frivolities. The black man can never be sure that the black woman needs or uses the money the way she claims she does. She hides money and sometimes begs every time she sees her man or any man whom she knows well enough to ask for money. The black man is sometimes better off actually paying the bills, rent, or buying the baby shoes himself. At least that way, he knows that the money is actually going for what she said she needed it for. She is too slick to just take her word. If the black woman lives with a man or spends the night at his house or spends the night at her house, she is known to sneak and look in his pockets and or examine the contents of his wallet, not always for money, but just to see what he has. If he leaves her alone in his apartment or house, she will look into every drawer and cupboard, checking out every name, address, bill, or scrap of paper. She thinks that the black man is holding out on her, so every opportunity she gets, she checks him out to see what he has or holds dear. She wants to look into anything that she thinks will help her learn more about the black man, and she wants to find out what makes him tick, but she is unable to get the real story because of her sneaky practices. Her whole life evolves around trying to find out about the black man. She is just going about it in the wrong way. When given the opportunity, she might take a few dollars out of his wallet without his knowledge. When asked to contribute or share a part of her money, she reserves full cooperation because black women do not think highly of each other when found to be giving money to the black man. This practice is connected to them thinking that if a man asks a woman for money and she gives it to him, then he is making a fool out of her. Again, the money is the measure. 
Sometimes, black women will purposely devise some elaborate scheme to meet a black man who has money, big dough, or connections to other successful people. If the black man has a lot of money and is rumored to spend it, he can just about have any black woman he chooses. Even if the woman does not want him, she will consider dating him if he is known to make a lot of money. The financially successful black man can be ever so nice, but if he is noted for being cheap, many black women will not go out with him. These black men who make or have what is considered big bucks have to be especially careful of the sincerity of the black woman he is dating, because if not, he is a prime candidate to be ripped off. Maybe not viciously, but ripped off just the same. Many times, black men would like to give the black woman money for what she says she wants, but his other experiences have usually shown him that if he does so, she will start acting like a fool and try to take unfair advantage of him. This knowledge prevents him from sometimes sharing in the way he would like to. On the other side, if she lives with him, she will try to keep up with his money as much as possible. She checks his receipts, his credit card record of expenditures, his glove compartment, his desk calendar at work, and peeps in any other place that she thinks might reveal what he is spending his money on. She is never sure if he is spending his money on another woman or not. She also checks to see if he is contributing too much financially to his extended family members, such as his mother, his brother, or his sister. She makes a mental notation if he spends money on his side of the family and makes sure that soon after she spends some money on her side of the family to keep it equal. She does not ever want to find out that she is covering home expenses with her money while he is giving his to his family. Since she equates control of her life with control of her man and control of her money, she is always on the lookout for suspicious looking signs that hint that he has spent some money she is unaware of. She will ask him how much did he pay for such and such and then try to verify the price to make sure he is telling the truth. She never just takes his word for anything. Sometimes he lies because he knows that she cannot handle the truth and will take him through a lot of hassles and changes about it. So he may lie just to keep her mouth shut and to keep from having a fight. In her psyche, money often is the god of her life and she monitors it closely. Sometimes, before marriage, she will spend money like it's water and there is no end to its flow. She dresses fabulously, drives a nice car, and has a nice place to live. She has beautiful jewelry, credit cards, and takes luxurious vacations or trips. After marriage, when she can no longer hide the fact that she has been living on a thin line of financial support, she is ready to dump the entire debt load on her new husband. While he was thinking that she had money of her own and is well endowed, she was only gaming on him to impress him that she is independently in the black. Because times are so hard and it requires a great deal of money to live comfortable, the black woman sometimes work outside the home. In other cases, she devises her own career goals and works because she enjoys it and has little interest in staying home and raising a family as a daily responsibility. Many times, the black man, if it were not for the financial strain it would put him under, would rather have his wife at home in his house, taking care of his children and caring for him. The black woman thinks that if she is not outside in the world, that she will not know what is going on or what he is doing. Sitting at home in the house is not appealing to her because it keeps her out of the limelight and she has to totally rely on his reports about what's going on in the business and social world. Plus, she wants to have fine clothes and a lot of extras that the black man's salary usually cannot cover. She wants what everyone else has, and since these things cost money, she is willing to work, work overtime, beg, borrow, steal, or trade her body for money and what money buys. 
Many of her wants are superficial and have no real value when it comes to being a good wife and mother. Gratefully, there have arisen a few black women who realize that a few dollars or a lot of dollars have little value when compared to certain happiness. Of course, there is another group who insist on paying for dinner or the movie so they can execute what they think is their equality. They also do this to have more control of the outing. If she is one of these types, the proper action for her to take is to place the money in the black man's hand so that he can pay the tabs personally. He must still stay in charge even if they are whining or dining on her money. Money is not the measure of who has the most power in a relationship. The power is distributed according to gender. Due to the black woman not being able to get along with the black man, there are multi-million single parent households today. They are run and operated by black women with children. Unfortunately, many of these black women believe that they are getting along better without a man living with them. They are dead wrong. It is not an easy job to haul groceries alone, pump gas, move furniture, handle all her business affairs alone, foot the bill for every item or activity in the house, watch television alone, pass up concerts or affairs because she has no date, defend herself and the house alone, attend PTA meetings alone, travel in the car at night alone, or handle emergency repairs alone. Although she won't admit it, there are many times during her day and night that she longs to be with a man and to have one with her to take care of things. But she weighs that idea against what she thinks she has to go through about her money, time, and actions. She still concludes that she would rather not have the hassle. She thinks she has more peace without one. She is sad and she is lonely and she needs a man to complete her world. Her big independent front is all a sham. Chapter nine, housekeeping. Another way the black man can access the mental condition of the black woman is to examine the way she keeps house. Although traditionally a fine dresser, the black woman is subject to keeping a nasty house. She dresses impeccable to go out in the most spectacular outfit, but her home or apartment may be a wreck. There may be roaches, rats, and bed vermin. Note that if her house is dirty, she can't be right. She will continue to keep a dirty house if the black man continues to act like it's not important. She will spend long, grueling hours at her hairdresser and not be willing to spend 30 minutes a day cleaning her living quarters. She is known to try to entertain a man in the midst of her messy house. She may blame her sloppily kept home on the fact that she works, goes to school, or just doesn't have time. These are all ranked excuses, which prove she has her priorities in the wrong order. There is no excuse for daily rumpled clothes strewn throughout the house, dirty ashtrays, dusty furniture, a sink full of dishes, soiled bed linen, spoiled food in the fridge or overflowing trash in the kitchen. If the bathroom is littered with hair, ring around the tub, crud in the sink or on the floor, the black woman's activities and attentions are misplaced. If her home is like any of the above descriptions, the black man can be sure that she's moving through life too fast, running the streets too much, and neglecting her home duties. She must be reminded by the black man to keep her house clean so that she will not think he is blind. When the black woman sees that the black man is observant and dissatisfied with her housekeeping, she may tighten up her act at least momentarily. Her habits are difficult to break. If the black woman lives with a black man, sometimes she starts out being on top of the house cleaning. Her next step is to ask the man to chip in and help. And the next step 
is to stop doing it altogether. The black man has every right to instruct his woman to clean up the house. If he complains and she rebels, her reaction may be to continue to let the house go to hell until she is ready to clean it up, which will not be when he tells her to. Black women and some black men also consider the house as the woman's domain and whatever she does in the house is her business and her responsibility. She is allowed to run it however she pleases. The rule seems to be that she controls inside and he controls outside. This is wrong. The black man has a right to decide how he wants his home kept, both inside and out. Keeping the house clean can become a real bone of contention between black couples. Black women associate keeping house for a man with being his maid, which has a somewhat negative connotation due to her being forced to be a maid during slavery. Housekeeping represents hard work that she is not interested in doing on a regular basis. She doesn't have time. If the black man expects the black woman to hang up his clothes or take care of them and cook dinner on time, iron a shirt every once in a while, wash or scratch his head, rub his back, or do any kind of wifely duty, she may respond, I ain't your mama, or I'm not his slave, or what's wrong with you? Get it yourself, or I don't feel like it, I'm tired. If the black woman would spend more time making her home a heaven for the black man, he might want to stay in it more instead of looking outside for peace of mind. Keeping the house clean also gives a black woman less time for the other foolishness she practices that bogs her down and steals her energy. No man wants to stay at home in a dirty house where he can't find a clean place to sit or lay. He also does not like it when his clothes are not clean and in place. The black woman thinks that he should take care of himself. She believes in unisex housekeeping. You take care of yourself and I'll take care of mine. If the black man should leave to go out to an undesignated destination, she believes that she has a right to go out too. She will exert all kinds of time adjustments in order to get dressed and leave when he does or shortly thereafter. She may even follow the black man or try to show up at the same place he hangs out and then act like it's a coincidence. The black woman does not know that no black man likes to look up in a club or bar and see his woman there when he doesn't expect her. This is one of the times that she could be home cleaning the house. But her anxiety tells her that if he can go out, so can she. If she's at home, she wants him to be at home too. When she is ready to go to bed, she wants him to be ready to go to bed too. That the black woman wants the black man home with her all the time is an absolute contradiction to her real desire because no woman wants a man under her feet every moment of the day, every day. She has other women type things to do. In spite of this, she remains determined to keep up with the black man, even if it means she has to neglect the house or herself. There is plenty for a woman to do at home on Friday and Saturday night, other than party. When she does go out alone, she likes to pretend that she is unattached and unavailable, but mainly she likes to go out so she can flirt a little and be flirted with. This reaffirms for her that she is still attractive and still in demand. She does this every once in a while as a test to see if she can still catch the attention of a man. In order for her to be satisfied with her survey, the quality of the man must be good. If a jive or square do makes a pass at her, it doesn't count. She may dance, act alluringly, or perform brazenly to get attention from strange men on the premise that she may just attract a good one. She wants to always keep her options open since she is admittedly dissatisfied with the black man she has. If she is angry with her man, she is more apt to go out night clubbing. 
She may return home later that night to her dirty house in complete disarray. She may be half drunk, stinking of tobacco, and reeking with sweat, and never tell her man how low down she behaved in public. Black women do not just go out with other women just to have companionship or to be together. They can be together at home. They sometimes travel in packs when they go out, so their motive will appear innocent enough. But if the black woman goes out clubbing at night alone or with her friends, she is looking for another man. Even if she only intends to fool around for that evening, she is up to no good. Make no mistake about her low intentions. She does not have any business being out at night by herself for the purpose of entertainment or in the name of having some fun. And she is wrong for trying to keep up with the black man by following him around. And she should be home before dark unless accompanied by a man or other security, unless she is attending to an emergency. Certainly, an emergency could be classified as running to the store for food or beverages or similar permissible trips. Black women think that staying in a night, especially on the weekends, is an outdated, old-fashioned idea designed to hold the black woman down. The black man should hold her down himself. Her so-called freedom and equality with the black man has put the black home in shambles. She can relax at home doing womanly things. And if she wants to dance or see dancing, she can watch BET Video Soul, or she can join a women-only aerobic class and dance up a storm and keep in shape at the same time. There are many societal rules that have not changed. They have remained firm because they create the desired result in the behavior of the citizens who inhabit the land. The desired result for the black woman is to be satisfied with her home and her family and commit herself to that establishment and not constantly fly into a tizzy every time the black man walks out the door. Her actions do not stop the black man from doing whatever he wants to do. They just wear her out from trying. There is another type of black woman who is meticulously clean. She might even be considered as too neat. She is obsessed with the eradication of dirt. Her nervousness makes her to possibly fix dinner and remove all the food and dishes before everyone is finished eating. If her man comes in late, she has already cleaned the kitchen, put all the food away, and dares anyone to mess it up again. She feels that if the black man stays out past the dinner hour, then he doesn't deserve to eat. The too neat black woman wants everything in place, including the black man. Subconsciously, this kind of black woman may try to clean up the external filth because of her high level of internal filth. She may brag to her friends that I got him trained and he knows not to mess up anything or I'll have a fit. And to keep from hearing her mouth, sometimes the black man obeys her house rules as if he is a guest. A black woman who is usually very neat will use the house as a battleground if she is displeased with the black man. She will stop cleaning up, stop cooking, and let it all go to hell as a statement of her dissatisfaction or to get his attention. She calculates that when the black man gets tired of eating out, wearing dirty, wrinkled clothes, and not having sex with her, he will relent, give in, and submit to her wishes. The black woman gains confidence when she is able to successfully trick the black man. She loves the challenge when the black man recognizes her tricks and games and tries to work a game back on her. She delights in trying to outmaneuver him. Albeit, the black woman practices larceny and some other kinds of nonsense. It is the black man who must bust her and bust her repeatedly until she gives up the game. Very few black women know the pleasure or thrill of being in accord with a black man. All the good things she says she wants would be immediately available to her if she drops her defenses, drops her suspicions, and allows herself 
to melt into the waiting arms of the man who loves her, the man who is man enough to provide and protect her and deserves her love, the man who is the most beautiful, the most regal, and the most sought-after creature on God's earth, the black man. This position would increase her self-worth and gradually heal the psychological wounds of this wicked society. Nothing she does takes the place of the black man. Even when she convinces herself that celibacy is not only healthy, but desirable, she is lying. Black women say they want a man desperately, but have given up because they can't find the one they want, so they would rather be alone. And they are. No idea or thing can replace the black man. He was the first life to appear on the planet Earth for as far back as can be determined. His will has kept this whole thing going. True, he is sometimes lost in the wilderness, battling beasts flocked against him. The black woman does not see him fighting for his life. Instead, she sees him as interrupting hers. He is a pain and he is a bother and he is not happy. No man can be happy until his woman lets him be. Such a powerful position the black woman seems to be in. The fact that her empowerment is self-destructive does not matter to her. She is selfish. She does not even know who the black man is. She does not know that she can have heaven on earth if his will be done. She won't even try it. She is a braggart and thinks she is too good to submit. She thinks she knows what's best and has to look out for herself. She lives in total fear that something might happen that she isn't ready for. She does not have to be on the front line. She can follow in the footsteps of her guide, but she won't let her guide get in front of her. She is afraid she will lose her place in line. She feels cornered. She says she slacks up on taking care of the house or caring for the black man because she gets bored and tired. Tired of the same routine day after day, day in and day out. The general duties of doing for the black man get to be a bother. Some black women will not even serve the black man a plate of food. Some will not even cook the food. Her modernicity tells her that if a certain activity gets old, she has to move on. It is odd that she bores of the regularity and uniformity involved in maintaining day-to-day -day life. The entire universe is built on harmony and repetitiveness. The great ball of fire and light we call sun rises every morning, day in and day out. All life on earth is generated from the dependability of the sun. It is certain and reliable, committed to its responsibility to rise and set every day in some form. So are the moon and stars, so is the earth and all the planets. The earth has been continuously spinning for over 76 trillion years of recorded history. If the earth stops spinning, all life will commence to halt and fall off. The 139,255,000 square miles of water would overpower the 57,255,000 square miles of land. The seasons of winter, spring, summer, and fall also clock in regularly with 12 months of every year every year. Nature comprised this routine system to benefit the inhabitants of each continent. Humans plan and survive based on the daily dependability of certain happenings established by nature. These routine occurrences give security. 
the black woman is out of sync with the natural order of the universe because she refuses to adhere to the principles set forth in a systematized existence where repeat means everything. The variations of daily life she craves is called disorganization and confusion. She refers to and defends her disorganization as doing things her own way. She maintains the idea that freedom means she can do things any way she pleases. There is no freedom without responsibility. Her purpose has been reduced to her obligation to fight for her rights of superiority over her man. The mere idea of obeying a black man, doing what he tells her to do, is considered as non-assertive. To work in unity with him on an idea can frighten her because she sees it as submersion of one personality into another. In business, this is called a merger. She does not want to merge with the black man to double his power because she wants individualism. The black man, his woman, and his children are considered a nation. No nation can survive and exist trying to cater to the individual needs of each member. There are overriding rules that must be obeyed by every member to ensure the success of the whole. The head of the nation must be respected and must make these determinations and enforce them. If the nation is wounded in the head because the body is diseased, it will soon be rendered invalid and crumble. It is a slow and deadly process that is predictable by learned social sciences. It is represented by what we see today in the chaotic existence of the black family. The black man and the black woman must become one in their unit. They must become one by thinking in the terms of one. They must be one in agreement of the goal and work in the interest of one. They are one. Nothing is more pleasing than peace at home daily. If the black woman works to try to please the black man, he will work to try to please her. By nature, the black man cannot submit to the black woman, so she is wasting everybody's time trying to do so. On her shoulders, she has the original hard head, hardened and frozen against the warmth of the black man's love. While the black man is reported to be dying faster than the black woman, it is the black woman who is helping him to his grave. Most ill health is caused by diet. The main job that women have always had is that of nutrition. Women prepare the food. It is a very important position in any nation because food is what sustains all life. Everything eats something. Yet the black woman complains about cooking and feeding her family as if it were an unnecessary assignment discovered to bother and repel her. She does not see it as a life-preserving duty. It is. The only connection to diet she has is when she's trying to lose weight. She is known to slap a meal together in 15 minutes. The black man must insist the black woman study foodstuffs and make determinations about which items are best for digestion, growth, and longevity of life. It is she who can single-handedly decide whether or not to extend the life of her family with well-planned, nutritious meals or to destroy it by delivering up quickly prepared, preservative-filled, valueless food designed to just fill the stomach. The only way the black man will live healthier and stronger is for the black woman to take over her responsibilities concerning nutrition. The body is only a machine of sorts. Take care of the machine and it will operate for a long time. If it is abused for 30, 40, or 50 years, it will decay and cease. 
allowing the children to eat junk food, forcing her man to eat out of greasy restaurants, and doing everything she can to keep from cooking is horrendous. The black woman must accept her job just as the black man must accept his. There is a very special equality in sharing in the necessary burdens of nurturing the black nation. None of this means that the black woman must dedicate her life in its entirety to cooking and cleaning. She must train her children to do their part. And if the right effort and the right spirit is shown, the black man is known to chip in and do his part in taking care of the home. Keeping the house clean is a shared responsibility of people who live together in the same dwelling. Each person must do their part. Some household duties are more tedious and unattractive and unattractive appearing than others, but all are required to live in a clean environment, inside and outside. If the black man shows a little interest and helps out, she is more apt to do better than she has in the past. Lastly, the black man should not allow the black woman to put him out or tell him to get out every time she gets mad at him. If she's mad, she should be the one that leaves. It's not her house. It belongs to them both. The black man must start to take a positive, firm look at what goes on around his home. The condition of his children, what his woman wears, what happens in his absence and presence. Many black men take the position that certain home activities or decisions are strictly up to the black woman. This is true only to a certain point. Whether or not the black man is directly involved or not, he should stay abreast of everything from the children's grades and recreation to his woman's menstrual cycle and what she cooks for dinner. He must stop pretending that he is not interested in what goes on with his woman and children. He has a right to know these things and the black woman has an obligation to make a daily or nightly report of the day's activities in the black man's home. This includes black women who do not live with the man they belong to. Separate quarters has no bearing on the sharing of important information if a man and woman have committed themselves to each other steadily. Today's relationship styles dictate that the man and the woman maintain secret, separate parts of their personalities that they do not share with each other or separate areas of their desires. These mates believe that there are certain special private things about them that their mate or other intimate friends absolutely should not know. So they practice the behavior of this part of them with others, strangers or relationships manufactured and considered to be distant enough from their day-to-day -day lives so as not to be found out. There should not be anything, not any part of a black man and a black woman that they cannot share with each other if called upon to do so. This does not just include pleasure. Everyone has certain frailties hidden inside that must be protected for fear of discovery and rejection. If the black man should happen to stay away from home or his woman for an ungodly length of time, such as longer than overnight, two, three, or four days, five, six, or seven days, etc., the black woman may let the house cleaning backslide a little bit. She at first worries alone. Then she tells her best friend. Then she tells her family. Then she makes the usual calls around town to see if anyone else has seen him. She may personally check out a few of his regular hangouts if he has any. And after she has exhausted all the routine channels, she starts to get angry. She becomes furious that he has disappeared seemingly without a trace and not called to let her know where he is. She is more concerned about where he is and who he's with than what his physical safety is. After about two days, she decides that he must be up to no good or he will call and check in. It is difficult to describe the terroristic thoughts that float through her head at that phase. She imagines up the worst catastrophes possible. 
not tragedies about sickness or bodily harm, but tragedies about him having gone for good, about him being with another woman, and about him being off somewhere, not loving her anymore. Whenever the black man is absent, the black woman starts to consider that he is gone because he doesn't want her anymore. She can't begin to surmise how he could be away from her for any extended amount of time and still love her. She thinks that if he is not with her, that she never crosses his mind. She thinks he forgets all about her when he becomes involved with other people or activities. She commences to plan how she will handle it, how she will greet him when and if he returns, and whether or not he will have a good excuse or explanation when he gets back. Actually, if the black man stays away from the black woman for an extended stretch of time, it is better if he stays away long enough for her to get over her anger. At first, she is worried. Then, she is suspicious. Then, she is mad. Then, she is lonely without him and decides she doesn't care what happened. She just wants him to come back. If he stays away for at least a week, by the time he returns, she will have gotten past the anger and will just be glad to see him. This may sound simplified, but the stages of missing the black man are very traumatic for the black woman. It is a period of extreme self-examination and insecurity. She not only may neglect the house, but she may neglect the present time and place she is living in. Her concentrated worry is all-encompassing and takes up nearly her every conscious moment. It is like a thud, a bitterness, a trembling in her stomach, and a nagging pool in the center of her chest, a constant ache, a longing for completion. If she is wise, she will use her time constructively, overhaul the house, redo her closets, make something, go someplace intelligent, or prepare a surprise for her man to welcome him home. She would be fine if she just remembers the good times, the dependability of her man's love, and that he is trustworthy with her love and would not go away and leave her forever. She should trust in his motives and know that if he is away, he has to be. And when he gets finished with whatever he is doing, he will come back and continue to love her just as much and things will be fine. She should continue on with her daily responsibilities, using her memory to remind her that a logical explanation will be forthcoming. The black man should explain to the black woman that sometimes he may have to be away, but that he will always return to her and that he does not stop loving her just because he sometimes has to be away from her. Chapter 10, Raising Children. The children, like every other entity at the black woman's disposal, are often used to attain certain goals with the black man. The first and most important issue here is that the rearing of children is the foremost responsibility of the black woman, not the daycare center, not the grandmother of the nanny. When the black woman raises her own children, she imagines she is using modern methods that create a well-adjusted, well-mannered, lovely child. But what eventually creeps through, if she is not interrupted, is that she raises her own children the same way she was raised. Since the black woman spends a lot of her mental energies thinking about how to capture the black man and get him to do her bidding, she is often frustrated with the children. This frustration may take the form of yelling, being verbally abusive, beating them, or leaving them with sitters so she doesn't have to deal with them. The black man, who loves children, does not understand what all of the yelling and screaming is about. He gets along fine with the children, and they obey and cooperate with him. But the black woman who is impatient will take out her hostilities about her condition on the children who in turn rebel, run amok, and play all sorts of games on her just to irritate her more. 
While not properly raising or teaching the children, she will sometimes dress them immaculately. She will also try to get the eldest child, be it male or female, to take part or most of the responsibility for caring for the younger children in the household. When this rendition of duty is overused, it robs the older child of their own youth because they are made to think like an adult parent in order to take care of younger brothers or sisters. If the black man works late or is out a lot, she becomes more angry because she thinks he is out having fun while she's stuck at home with a bunch of scrawling brats. If the woman is angry with the man, she will neglect the children in small ways. If the black man notices this, he will remind her that she should take better care of the children, and she might remind him that he ain't the one taking care of them. She is. She may stop cooking or washing clothes by claiming that she is exhausted and can't do another thing. Examine the situation. Some black women have managed to work this game so effectively on the black man that in many homes today, the man is cooking, cleaning, ironing, grocery shopping alone, and getting the children off to school, bathed at night, and put to bed because the woman will either not do it or she has convinced him that he should. It is her job to do the mothering parts. He should assist. If the man has a son or daughter who looks exactly like him, remarkably like him, and the woman is constantly mad at the man, she will sometimes unconsciously or purposely mistreat the child. Since she cannot get back at the father himself, she will take it out on the child. This is a very dangerous practice. The innocent child can be caught up in this web of abuse and be at risk. It is impossible for a black woman to hate the father of her child and treat the child normally. The child is a daily and nightly reminder of her intimate relationship with the man. The baby may be a novelty at first, but as time passes and the child develops and grows up, it may be a problem to her because he or she represents the father's presence. Any behavior traits the child displays that are exactly like the father's mistakes makes her even angrier and she will beat and punish the child to try to remove the part that reminds her of the father. If the black man is not present to defend himself, she may tell the child bad things about its father. This mostly happens when she and the child's father are not together in current relationship. She will tell the child, one, your father don't care nothing about you. I'm the one who loves you. Two, he don't take care of you, I do. Three, if he wanted you, he'd be here with you. Four, he ain't thinking about you. He's out there with his other woman. Five, I can't buy you that because your father won't give me any money. Six, your father is a bum. He ain't got no job. He ain't got nothing. She says these and any other insults she can think of to turn the child against the father because she is angry with him. She wants the child or children to take her side against the father to punish him. It is a given that the relationship between the man and his children is directly related to the relationship he has with the mother. The black man loves his children but does not have the same maternal instincts of the mother because it is not his nature. But when forced, he will care for and raise the child himself. If the father visits the child and the child is standoffish, uptight, starts to cry or is hostile and combative, the black man can be sure that it is because of something the mother has told it about him. The small child's mind cannot decipher the information the black mother tells it about its father. The child does not know how to make the transfer. They do not know how to front. They are happy or sad. The poor black man does not know that all of this has taken place behind his back and is baffled and may rebuff or spank the child because of his whining or uncooperation. He does not know that the entire act has been staged by the mother in the background. 
The black woman who is separated or angry with her man is negative about him in front of the child. She doesn't realize how harmful this is because she is only concerned with her own happiness or unhappiness. Secretly, she hopes that the child, although immature, will make a plea for her in the father's presence. It is the black woman who must teach the black child to love and respect their father, just as she teaches it everything else. It must be taught to love and respect its father, whether he is financially taking care of it or not. The black woman removes the father figure from her child's life because of her own dissatisfaction without having anything to replace it with. A black mother, no matter how much she tries, cannot be a black father to a black child. There are many non-monetary values that the black father is capable of teaching the child. The black man owns the child just as much as the black mother. She does not have more ownership just because she carried the baby in her womb. A woman cannot have a baby without the aid of a man. He is equal owner of the child and has an equal right to love it and care for it. The parental coalition gives unity of direction and security to the child. The black woman is also too trusting of strangers with her child. She does not know the personal quirks or values of the people who work in the daycare center. If a child is with an adult for six to nine hours per day, Monday through Friday and sometimes weekends, some of the ideas and attitudes of the sitter are being passed on to the child. Other than occasional exceptions, the black woman should stay with her own child. This is not saying that a qualified, trusted babysitter should not be employed, but to take an eight-week-old baby to a daycare center and leave it there until its school age is a mistake. The extended family on both sides should take up the job of keeping the child and they too should be given explicit instructions about what to do or not do and what to say or not to say in order to support the parents' ideas of child raising. The black child may also hear negative talk about the black father from the grandparents on the mother's side or from the mother's new man. Often. Arguments occur about the child's father between the mother and her new man. All kinds of derogatory remarks may be made by the new man if he is jealous of the biological father. Sometimes the mother herself will make the comments to try to convince her new man that she has no remaining feelings for the child's father. This is wrong and it confuses the child. Some children defend the absent parent while others will agree with the charges. Thus, the black man is not always unfeeling when he does not maintain a flourishing relationship with his child by an estranged mate. He continues to look for peace elsewhere. He may become single focused on trying to make a new home for himself someplace else. He is by nature driven to mate. The black man has the added pain of the black mother refusing to allow him to discipline the child or have a say in his activities. She claims that she is the mother and the child will do as she says. The black father must insist on taking an active part when possible of raising the black child. Certainly, there are cases when the father's presence is emotionally unhealthy for the child, so separation must prevail. However, this decision should not be made based on money, dollars, cents. The black woman is under the misplaced notion that if the black man does not contribute financially to the child, that he can have no say-so in the child's rearing or make any decisions concerning the child. And in some cases, she even refuses to let him see the child. While it is certainly true that the black man should help take care of the material needs of his children, mere money alone should not be the total measure as to whether or not he can be involved in his child's life. Black children are not for sale between the parents and their emotional care 
should not be based on who spends the most or pays the most for the child. There are situations where the black man cannot provide for himself or anyone else. The black woman charges him for being in the condition he is in and will refuse his participation in the child's upbringing based on financial support. It has been proven that money alone is not sufficient to raise a well-adjusted child. Their emotional needs and mental stability must be met by both the mother and father. Whomever is best qualified and suited to contribute financially to the child should do so whether it be the mother, the father, or both. The child needs both parents regardless of how the parents may feel about it. The children should not suffer because the parents do not get along as husband and wife or lovers. A black mother needs all of the sincere input she can muster to help her raise her sons and daughters. She is not qualified to do this alone. She has too many emotional problems herself. She and the children need a man daily to help to support and steady them both. This kind of needed assistance from the black man has nothing to do with money. Needless to say, the black man's responsibility to his children is a real one, and it is a responsibility that should be accepted and respected. The U.S. judicial system and courts should have nothing to do with it. It is not their business or authority. In the rearing of black children, the black mother should screen all TV shows, cable, movies, or social activities before allowing the child to see or participate in them. The values and judgments formed by children from external sources play a major part in how the child will form opinions. The black mother must devise her own entertaining activities whenever possible. Home games, arts and crafts, field trips, family outings, story time, religious training, chores, biking, cooking, picnics, the beach, amusement parks, etc are just a few social activities that children can participate in. Of course, they all require the accompaniment of an adult. There is no end to the list of interactive and entertaining socializations, but the black mother must join in herself and not leave it to the creativity of others to amuse and teach her child. And it is senseless to try to give a child each and everything they point at certainly not just to amuse it. She will often treat the child or children as if they are an interruption in her life instead of the reason for it. Raising the nation is the first responsibility of the black woman after caring for her man. If blacks want better children, there must be better mothers who are genuinely interested in raising children and concerned about the outcome of her child rearing tactics. Another area of insensitivity the black woman practices is that she is too lax and careless with the child's safety when she has another man other than the child's father spending the night with her. Black women become so engrossed in their social experiences with whomever her man is at the moment that she does not place enough priority on privacy. Privacy to ensure that the child does not ever hear her having intimacies with her man. Single black women may have many men over the course of their child's lives during 18 years. Since the black woman is not sensible enough to make and settle down to a good choice, she is periodically speculating and becoming involved with new men. Her affairs have a definite pattern of beginning, middle, and end. She becomes familiar with the schedule and is able to predict the longevity of a relationship by the age of 30. She learns to function and enjoy each stage and will actually look forward to them, the opening and the closing. Her routine does not change. She believes that her program is right and that if she holds on to it, eventually she will find the right man. Her problem, as she sees it, is that she just keeps getting with the wrong men. Her hunt for the right man can encompass 20, 30, or 40 years. 
She does not realize that at the end of every failed relationship that she is possibly guilty of the same behavior that destroyed the previous one. Her blindness makes her see things that are not really there. She is so desperate and so headstrong, she persists in her same game plan, seeking one man after another to satisfy obnoxious demands. If she finally gets to the one she claims she really wants, but abuses him so much that he doesn't want her, she will institute several processes to prevent this from happening, at least to prolong the inevitable and give her some secure leverage against the man. As a last resort, she will get pregnant. Every black woman knows that no matter what the future brings, if she has a baby by a man, she will be included in his life some kind of a way for at least about 20 years. In this position, she feels her benefits of connection to the man outweigh the fact that the man doesn't want her and that she tricked him into being forced to deal with her. She believes the baby gives her a right to contact him at any time, have mutually concerned discussions, force him to deliver money to her, consult him in family emergencies concerning the child, which sometimes she makes up, and will require him to have contact with her on a routine basis if she can arrange it. On one side, she dotes on the child to impress the father and on the other hand, if the child does not provide her with any of the aforementioned amenities with the father, she may lose interest in it. This is a very dangerous rectangle for the child. It can come to represent its low-down dog of a father or be blamed for broken career dreams. In either case, the innocent baby suffers since to the black woman, it can come to represent a failure. The failure of a relationship and the failure of a plan, one she is stuck with. Sometimes black women decide they have finally birthed the golden child they have prayed for all their lives. Hallelujah. They trade wifedom for motherhood. The baby becomes the center of her life. She neglects the father, the house, and herself in order to worship the baby. This is not the way it should be. The baby is a physical manifested result of the union between man and the woman, and therefore the baby is third, not first. The black woman will treat the black man as if he had no part in creating the baby and will direct her every waking moment to caring for the baby and ignoring the man. This is wrong. The black man should not be dumped out of his rightful place as the most important entity in the home just because he reproduces himself via his woman. This does not mean that the black baby should be devalued or mistreated, but the black man is first. His needs must be attended to in such a way as not to make him feel that he must come in second to his own offspring. A newborn baby is not God and should not be worshiped. It has its place and priority, but it does not have superiority over the man who made it. The black man must recognize this practice and correct it as soon as possible. The black woman should also not be allowed to bring the baby into the bedroom and keep it there for month after month. The black woman must be introduced to a new household organization schedule after she births a child. If this is not done, she becomes confused and will consider the black man's presence an interruption between her and her new toy, the one that he implanted in her womb while making her feel good. If the black man has children by another woman from a previous relationship, the black woman does not like it and may not accept the child as the sister or brother of the one she has. She may do everything she can to keep her child from even knowing that other children exist who have the same father. She bases this on her warped ideas of what she believes her child's family structure should be like. She may insist that her child have expensive toys and clothes and gadgets galore 
And if the black man pays child support to what is wrongly labeled as his outside child, she increases her demands to make sure that hers is well taken care of first. She discounts the desire of the black man to have all of his seed know and love each other. He's often forced to live a double life because if he brings up his outside child at home, his live-in black woman will raise hell. She may selfishly think only of herself and will try to prevent any of her friends from knowing that her man has other children. She and her family may not include his outside children in family gatherings or holiday activities. If she must confront or accept a child, she may slyly ask questions to learn about the mother or to find out how much time her man actually spends with it. She refers to the child she birthed as mine and to the other children as his. This is wrong. They are all his. Black women are also famous for not trusting each other with each other's children if they had them by the same man. They think, because of what is in their own hearts, that the other woman may mistreat her child. All of this is ignorance because children are always elated to find out about or meet their other sisters and brothers. Some black children are deprived of this right for many years, sometimes until adulthood. Whether or not the children should know each other should be discussed in terms of the development of the children, not the whim of the adults. Sometimes separation is the only way it can be, but the black man should have the final say-so on his children, and the black woman should do her part to form the kind of nation that he chooses for his offspring. Until the black woman accepts her appointed duty as mother and wife, Blacks will continue to see the destruction of the black family. There is no magic about how a nation survives to leave a legacy of a glorious past. There are principles that govern the outcome of any given set of circumstances. By abandoning the principles of a civilized black society, the black woman has instead absorbed a set of mores that help destroy black people. She is waiting for something external to happen in order to change herself internally, to change the way she thinks, the way she thinks about her man and her children and any other children he sires. Few children are planned. They are only a byproduct of sexual intercourse. It is impossible for a black woman to raise a black male child who is confident and secure if during his lifetime, all he hears from his mother is derogatory remarks about black men. He is usually attached to his mother and she often treats him as if he is deaf. She talks to her friends and family and does not realize the male child may be paying rapt attention to her every word and action. She does not have a special set of guidelines she uses to raise her boy child. The most she knows about the development of a black boy is to make sure that he develops physically, usually sports-wise, so he can gain the muscle strength and masculinity he will need as a man. She is used to changing with the times and therefore has no sense of steady direction by which to steer the black boy. Often, she makes the boy child hang out with she and her women friends. She knows little about how to make a man so the boy is overly exposed to the feminine side of life. The black woman has a very special love for her male baby. Her boy remains her prize. She may also change clothes in front of the boy, bathe, or walk around half-dressed. She will also allow him to sleep in the same bed with her for an inordinate length of time, up to several years old. She says she doesn't see anything wrong with this type of behavior. After all, she says, I'm his mother. When he is born, she lays him on her stomach or chest and lets him sleep there. It is a bonding process. After he is weaned, sometimes she continues to let him sleep on top of her or across her lap. While this is not a questionable practice of a mother, it is not always a good idea for a male baby 
because he becomes too accustomed to the scent of his mother's body, including her vagina. During this stage, she may also be kissing him in the mouth or sucking his lips instead of kissing him on the cheeks or forehead. She also thinks that this practice is okay. She's his mother. The baby is not mentally developed enough to understand that his mother is prohibited to him sexually. He may not even be able to understand or identify it as a sexual attraction since the sensation of being close to his mother's body has always been pleasurable to him. It is also pleasurable to the mother, just as nursing is. The black mother is not intentionally participating in unhealthy behavior with her baby son. She just doesn't know any better. The mother has a special relationship with her son. This is not to say that the daughter is estranged from her or that the baby girl is less adored, but the black baby boy represents the only black male that the black woman can execute any control over, and she may try to wean him of all ideas, notions, and attitudes she resents in the adult black male. In effect, she tries to brainwash him against the natural traits of his nature. She may preach to him from a very young age that she does not want him to turn out like his father. The confused values and ideas the black woman stores are not limited to the black girl. She cannot successfully raise a black male child without a black man. She does not have it in her. She barely knows how to teach or train the black female child, and she knows absolutely nothing about how to be a man to a woman or a woman to a man. Unfortunately, she will also use her children as a way to get back at the black man or punish him. She will refuse to allow the black father to have access to the child based on the adult problems she and the father are having. The children should not suffer because of the disagreements between the parents. She would rather the child not have a father figure or be shifted from one man friend to the next rather than allow the black father to raise his own child. Unless the black father voluntarily gives up his rights as a father for the peace and benefit of the child, the mother should promote the relationship. And no, it is not enough for the black woman to just say she wants the black man. She must also be in agreement with him about his goals, his lifestyle, his home life, and how he wants to raise his children. She must believe in him and have confidence that he can provide and protect her. She claims that she starts out believing and giving the man the benefit of the doubt, but that he always messes up. She does not understand that her beneficence in giving him the benefit of the doubt is not good because there is no benefit in doubt. If she doubts him, the doubt will grow until decay sets in. Black people in America have demonstrated that it is impossible for them to unite as a group and agree on a common goal. However, unity remains the most powerful tool on earth to change the condition of something or someone. The practice of unity must begin in the home of the black woman, and it is there where she must set the example for the new nation. The black woman is the vehicle of the diseased ideas that permeate the minds of black youth. She allowed destructive suggestions to invade her children and did not replace them with better values. She cannot properly teach her children until she has properly taught herself. Motherhood skills are not automatic. The mother's love connection to the cub is automatic, but that feeling is just the basis for inspiration to do the other work necessary to raise the child. The black woman must have a new set of instructions and mothering techniques that will produce a new black child. It may take up to 50 years just to retrain the black woman to respect the black man. It is the black woman who must institute this change, and it is a change that must be made in the cradle and one she must learn to practice. If the black woman chooses fancy clothes and jobs over saving her man, children, and home, the American government cannot be charged with inflicting genocide on black people. She herself will be guilty of suicide and murder. 
she destroys herself and kills off her nation as a whole. Graveyards and incinerators are filled with the fruit of her womb, and she is not concerned. She believes there is not enough room on earth for her child, and she believes she will not be able to afford to raise it, and she believes that birth control is the key to her well-being and future. She assents to abortion. She does not recognize her power. She practices selective breeding because she alone decides which black child will be born and which one will not. The statistics she reads about black teenage pregnancy convince her that something must be done about the black birth rate. Something has been done, and if it were not for the natural drive of nature and young black unprepared mothers, the population numbers of the black nation in America would be moving towards near extinction. These young girls, as undesired as they may be, are birthing the black nation of tomorrow against practically everyone's wishes. But black babies are being born and they need the guidance of black fathers. Older black men must teach and train the young black men about how to be proper fathers and guides. The black woman does not know that every black man that exists wants to carry on his seed. He wants to reproduce himself and continue his bloodline. Many black women defer having children until they accomplish educational goals, career status, travel, etc. Oftentimes, the last thing they want is the responsibility of a baby. So it becomes easier for the black man who knows about this idea to accept that he too does not want children. And of course, there are strident financial considerations, doctors, pediatricians, hospital bills, baby furniture, clothes, diapers, food, milk, medicine, and so forth. The black woman is the ultimate consumer and whenever possible will purchase the most expensive items as a way to show her love for the child. She chooses expensive shows of opulence to impress her friends and to make sure the black man financially does his part for the child. They can be a tremendous economic strain on the black man and his family. He knows that the strain will be great because he is aware of the black woman's unhealthy desire for material things. It is less trouble for him to agree that he doesn't want any children either. It is impossible for a black man not to want sons and daughters from his own loins. Every creature desires to reproduce itself. Consequently, the black woman must sacrifice her dashing, well-planned American future for the honor of reviving the black nation. She must get in order, the order that the black woman was in to produce all of the other great and successful black nations. She cannot control the black man and be successful. She cannot yet comprehend that what she is battling in the black man is his very nature, which cannot be grafted out. It is his very nature to accept certain things and reject others, to do certain things no matter what the cost. The black man in America is the only male on earth, including every continent, who is disrespected by the women in his nation. This situation does not exist any place else among the billions of people inhabiting our planet except her and America. The other black men, the yellow men, the red men, the brown men, and the white men are all honored and respected in their respective nations. All other women recognize and accept the man as the authority, the ruler, and the leader. Only here, only in the black nations scattered throughout the United States is the man neglected. This is not a natural situation. Women from other countries do not collectively band together to destroy their men. They are in accord with the natural order of the universe. Man first, then woman. This is not to say that the woman does not have rights of equality within her domain or any other domain that her man chooses to award her with. No matter how much education, money, dowry, national or local prestige other women have, they do not try to take over and rule their men. If the black woman in all of her infinite wisdom is so competent, then why are there two generations of black drug addicts, homosexuals, lesbians, paranoid schizophrenics, and murderers? Each of these pitiful black men and black women or black youth, as the case may be, 
were born of a black woman. If the black woman would give as much attention to raising her children as she gives to her wardrobe, her hair, and nails, we would not have the self-destructing youth seen today. It is the mother who must teach and train the child. It is a job, and it is a job not without accountability. The black woman's greatest dream is to have the black man be a father to her babies. She wants him to love them and spend time with them, and she wants him to insist on being a father to his child. She wants him to claim the seed he implanted in her womb. About Child Support Today's laws for enforcing child support payments are very strenuous. The courts are arresting fathers who fall behind in their contributions. Many black men claim that they do not like to pay child support because their child's mother does not use the money to take care of the child and instead uses the weekly or monthly payments from the father to purchase clothing or other frivolous articles that are in no way directed towards the upkeep of the child. This is not a difficult problem to rectify. When the black man is convinced that the child is not receiving the benefit of his financial contributions, it is better for him to take an active interest in and learn how to shop for his child or children so that he can make purchases himself. This obviously requires the estranged black father to be actively involved in a parent-child relationship during which time he is able to observe the child's clothing, medical, or toy needs. Shopping trips with the child are a favorite activity and create an outing during which lunch can be included, perhaps a movie or window shopping. The black mother will not like an arrangement where she does not get her hands on the money. But as long as the father is doing his part to help provide for the child, she will not be able to refuse the assistance or reject this form of subsidy. Under no circumstances should the child suffer because the black father believes that his child is not benefiting from his child support payments. The black mother will often exaggerate the cost of items she claims the child needs so that the father will have to come up with unusual sums of money. As already mentioned, the American judicial system has no business having to force a black father to take care of his own children. The main way he is willing to do this is if he has an active role in the child's growth and development.